This is a pop-up call asking the question, is OGM an organization or a movement or some or a, a floor wax or a toothpaste uh, <laughs> on Friday, August 6, 2021? Um, and yeah, and, and so we're sort of in this weird culture right now where say the wrong thing and you get cut out of the herd. Um, I was listening to a really nice talk uh, about call-in culture. Uh, it's a TED talk, I'll, I'll find it in a second. Um, but it was really interesting. It was like, hey, you know, I've survived a whole bunch of stuff. Hey, Pete, um, I think you're locally muted. Yeah, I was just uh, talking to Joanne. Okay, good. <laughs> gotcha, good. Um, let me just find the call in. Say we're talking to Jordan or uh, Joanne, my wife. Joanne. <clears throat> she was a great contributor on the meeting on the emerging essentials. Yeah, she was. I just want to be a little mouse on her shoulder as she does, you know, <laughs> reads all these things and filters them, and you know, yeah. I'm, I'm lucky. Uh, so, I tried to watch, but I could only hear you. <laughs> So a million years ago, Kenneth Tyler of SeedWiki fame, uh, who is in the OGM mix, uh, said to me, wouldn't it be cool if you could look over the shoulder of six people who were madly obsessed about, and I'm paraphrasing here, but madly obsessed about six kind of semi-overlapping fields of, uh, of interest to you. And this is before Twitter existed, I'm pretty sure. And for me, like Twitter was that thing. It doesn't complete thing it's not the same but man it gets really close because you can pick who you follow and you can find those those brilliant clever obsessive people who are who are like look tuning in on something that needs to be digested and get the best of what they think is happening and it's it works much better for me than any kind of rss reader or any of that kind of stuff um and it's changed my it's changed my world in great ways Agreed. hey michael hey dave um I'm curious to know what you were just describing, what you were, what you were talking about. Um, we were just praising Johan, who is Pete's wife, um, and her, the merits of her absolute focus on what's happening around the Delta variant and COVID and all that. And I was then wishing I could be a mouse on her shoulder. And then I brought back an old story of Kenneth Tyler saying, wouldn't it be great if you could look over the shoulder of six people who are like crazily, madly uh, uh, filtering stuff in six, six kind of overlappy domains that you care about. And, and, and that was before Twitter existed. Twitter kind of started to fulfill that, that wish. And Factor, I think, has that, that sort of same, same exact flavor to it, right? So you know, what, does, what does your radar display look like? Um, and my advice to people trying to figure out Twitter is like, do not use Twitter the way you use Facebook. In Facebook, you follow your friends and it's a way to figure out who broke their leg and who just had a, a, a wedding. Um, and on Twitter, you need this like really carefully tune who you follow or your Twitter feed will turn to crap. Um, and, and vice versa, if you tune it well, it's, it's superlative. It's really, my, my Twitter feed has not gone down the tubes my, and my Twitter feed is still where I see breaking news. Um, faster than CNN, faster than anything else, I'll be like, oh my God, there's an earthquake someplace or there's a fire someplace or somebody just said something particularly stupid. Um, so let's start in on the topic, um, which has lots of kind of different kinds of roots or, or origins in conversation. A lot of it uh, comes out of multiple different conversations Pete and I have had around the nature of OGM and how many OGMs are there and uh, what it is, is OGM a hashtag or should it be a company or whatever else? And I think I wanna just listen, I, I, Pete, if you don't mind, I'd love to listen to you just riff on the question and then see what, what, where that puts everybody else. And I'll just like listen carefully and chat on the chat for a while uh, and, and see where that takes us. And I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to be the conversation facilitator, but I just wanna listen and absorb because I think I have a lot of, I've been working for 18 months, I've been working to figure out how to explain OGM to people so that I can make a living standing in the middle of it, <clears throat> doing some kind of informational jujitsu and trust building. And I still don't really know what that is. Um, it's a little elusive. Uh, Stacy and I were just, a, we were the first two on the call and she said something to which I replied, it's a, a little bit like we're doulas for a new kind of socio-cultural technical system that's emerging and it's complicated and we're trying to help sort it out. And if we're, if we're lucky, we'll have had a little bit of influence on how that all plays out. 
So with that, Monsieur Kaminsky. Uh, do you want to say the question again? Yes. Is OGM an organization or a movement or something else? Um, uh, I was inspired uh, with a with a talk by uh, uh, Jordan Sukut. Um, uh, he and I were talking about um, how to make how to how to like activate people using or being in in a movement um, without having people feel like the movement is owned by somebody. Um, so uh, what we ended up talking through I, uh, was was using a hashtag for the movement instead of a, a .org or .com or whatever. Um, because I, I guess I was poking him, you know. So w when, where do you put the fact page uh, if you're a movement, right? Does it go on movement.org, movement.com? or what, right? And then as soon as you have movement.org, then it's like, okay, well, so who's behind movement.org? What's their business model? You know, do I trust them? Do I not trust them? Um, it's owned, you know, domain names end up with ownership. Um, and you can kind of hack around that. And we do that, we do it a fair bit um, with people um, who have foundations. So the Linux Foundation sponsors a bunch of cool efforts in the world to make the world a better place. Um, and everybody knows that, you know, that the website is, is or the whatever is, you know, the, the development stuff or whatever is funded and sponsored and, and shepherded by the Linux Foundation. So everybody goes, well, I guess I trust the Linux Foundation. They're doing cool stuff. And I, I, I can kind of trust that this organization is, but it still ends up being an organization rather than a mo movement. Um, and Jordan really, for, for this use case, he really wanted a movement. Um, so that hashtag thing is different than a domain name. It's different than a .org. One of the interesting things that happens is that other people can start to use it and own it and change it and you know make it their own. So, um, so Jordan and I talked a little bit about, so what do you do when, so the, so the use case is, you know, where's the fact page for, um, you know, hashtag movement, um, you just Google it and you find what different people think about it and you find different facts on different organization websites and you know different people have different takes um and that's kind of okay that's that's what jordan was looking for um for this use case um i, I started talking about how maybe sometimes you want to put two hashtags together like so jordan's organization is lionsburg so maybe he wants lionsburg and whatever the hashtag of the movement is maybe those are both hashtags at some point um when a hashtag is, is more like a name, an organization name, and you can go look up lionsburg.org, you know, you go, okay, I get it. One hashtag is, is a little bit more organizationally minded and the other one is movement minded. And then when you put them together, you can actually get something synergistic. I think you can say that Lionsburg is a movement organization, right? Um, so it made me think about two things. One of them about generative commons. I think generative commons is, is more of a hashtag, more of a movement than an organization. And maybe OGM is more of a movement than an organization. So, uh, so maybe Massive Wiki, when it's doing things in the world, sometimes it's affiliated with Flotilla. Sometimes it's aff affiliated with Kika Lab. Uh, sometimes it's affiliated with the open global mind movement, right? So you could see hashtag massive wiki, hashtag open global mind, you know, and then um, it's it feels different when you're saying I'm joining a movement, I'm co-creating a movement, I, I own it. So a couple of the things that, that resonate around the movement part of it, um, uh, I know of an old historical one. Uh, called Critical Mass. Critical Mass is a, a bicycle activist group um, with, uh, with generally good reputation, but a little bit bad reputation. Um, Critical Mass was explicitly started as a xerocracy, it's called, because the way that you, they, they wanted, they, they didn't want a head of the organization to get lopped off. Um, so the organizers of Critical Mass were anonymous and um, the way that they distributed information about the group was by um, photocopying, Xeroxing. So they would go to a local print shop with a master of a flyer and 
um, it would get photocopied and plastered all over the place by people who didn't know where it actually came from. So they just believed in the ideas and the, the, the movement. Um, uh, much more recently, Black Lives Matter is also um, a movement that was, you know, founded by probably in a multiple, a few people together um, started talking about it and it's, it's publicly owned um, and it's a movement and um, it's, it, it means different things to different people. Um, we've also noted that uh, in, in a previous call, I guess it was, um, we were talking about sometimes you get weird effects, you get um, bad people taking over your movement and you say, you know, they, they say, you know, Black Lives Matter is, you know, is, is, is this, and they, they totally pervert the original, the movement um, and turn it upside down. Or uh, you get spin-offs uh, like All Black, All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter or, or whatever, right? Um, but that's kind of par for course. And I don't think Black Lives Matter, the movement has necessarily suffered because it's had these essentially a attacks or or spin-offs uh, nearby. Um, in some sense, it actually makes it stronger, right? You get a community response of people saying, no, it's Black Lives Matter. It's not All Lives Matter. And there's a reason why Black Lives Matter. Um, and you get a bunch of people explaining that. You don't have one fact page for that. You have you know, a thousand voices on Facebook and Twitter and, and the intertubes. Um, one last thing, uh, the the guy that invented the concept of hashtags, uh, Chris Messina, also invented um, another movement called Bar Camp, uh, which was really big and really, really uh, influential um, from, I don't know, 2005 or whatever to 2010 or 15. Um, uh, he explicitly didn't want to bother with the overhead of having um, a legal team to protect the, the trademark of Bar Camp. Um, and so he made a couple of blog posts uh, about um, Bar Camp being a community mark, is what he called it. Something that, hey, folks, you know, um, Bar Camp is a thing. I believe in it. He had a, uh, Chris is a bit of a graphic designer. So he had designed a cool logo for Bar Camp and the, and the font and stuff. And <clears throat> in subsequent, um, kind of like TEDx is a syndication of the original. Um, there were syndications of Bar Camp, Bar Camp Austin, Bar Camp, I don't know, DevOps or whatever. Uh, it was encouraged actually to take the original logo and tweak it a little bit, make it your own. And so you saw a whole bunch of probably hundreds of, of different Bar Camp logos that you could tell were of the original and also different and, and unique. So that was really cool. The, the idea of a community mark is, hey, it's not that I own Bar Camp, the brand, we own it together. And if it matters to us, we protect it. So when people do bad things to it, um, I, I hope he didn't say you must. I, I, he said something like, I hope the community comes together to protect it. Um, and that's what we see happening with, for instance, Black Lives Matter. So that's my answer. That's awesome. Thank you for turning over <clears throat> the soil so nicely. Um, are there any other community marks that you know of? Like who has, has this been picked up? Is community marks a movement? Uh, community marks did not turn into a movement as far as I know. Um, I think we see, we see there's, there's some, I don't know if it's a spectrum or, or whatever, but there's a there's a spectrum between kind of a brand-ish name. Black Lives Matter is probably a good example. Um, over to um, memes, right? Like, uh, who's the man now, dog? You know, or whatever. Um, so, uh, um, uh, Dogecoin and and the various um, the various descendants of Doge. Um, is kind of an interesting case, use case. Um, Bitcoin is actually another interesting one. Um, there is a Bitcoin.org, but I'm not sure that anybody really looks at that as the center of Bitcoin. Um, and Bitcoin is a strange thing anyway, because nobody knows who the founder was, nobody knows where the Genesis block is from or who has it. Or there's, yeah. a, there's a bunch of mystery at the, at, the, at, the, at the core of that body of code. 
and movement, even though I think the body of code itself is relatively known and unified, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely a, an origin to it, but <laughs> yeah. uh, Satoshi is, is anonymous, yeah. Right, right. Um, anybody else? Just want to riff on this, jump on in? I mean, I was sticking some stuff in the in the chat just because I'm curious about this stuff too, Peter. And the I, I'm trying to distinguish between like what's a tool versus you know or a technology kind of. So to me, it's like like a hashtag is. I mean, I guess it, I guess there's a movement, the hashtag movement. I don't know. Doesn't seem quite right. The hashtag seems like a tool. The tool was adopted widely. Maybe there was a movement that caused the tool to be adopted. So the hashtag movement led to the hashtag being adopted or something and that's just kind of internalized we don't think about a movement of hashtags anymore i don't know um i, I think I, I got a little bit lost in the meta part of that about i think so, that some of the times we're talking about so an open global mind or the you know jerry's brain right the the, the approach of openness i think of as a technology mm -hmm. so we're we're looking for the adoption of the technology i guess and that process of getting adoption may require a movement, yep. but the actual thing is a technology. So openness, I, I, I would I call that a technology. Yeah, um, and so, you know, hashtag open or hashtag, um, you know, Libre or something like that uh, is maybe kind of a thing. I think um, open global mind to me is a, is a mindset. It's actually not a tool um, and it's, uh, I, I would say that it encompasses not even I, it's funny I, I've it's been a long time since I've I've talked to somebody who has a broader definition of tool than me <laughs> um, so for for instance for me a stop sign uh, or two stop signs or something like that is a collaboration tool you know it's a it's you know a, a way that we've invented to <clears throat> kind of recognize a, you know, a, a situation in which we need to negotiate uh, certain rules, negotiate a space for, for, uh, via certain rules. Um, open global mind for me is, is much more of a mindset and I can't make it into a tool in my head. Um, even, even the kinds of tools, openness is, uh, yeah, openness for me is, I guess, is a mindset, not a tool. Yeah, I mean, maybe you can call it a philosophy, but then it's implemented by a, a, a set of tools. A creed. It's a trait, <clears throat> it's a trait I think. Trait. trait. Another thing I've said is OGM is a verb. Right. Um, we've also had people say OGM is an adjective. Or an adjective, yeah. Something being OGM-y. Yeah, as opposed to OGM-ing, gerund or adverb. I, I like the the action in calling it a verb, actually. Anybody else? Uh, so uh, I, I will speak in a little bit, which is I think I think my major concern is <clears throat> the definition of what it means to OGM or to be OGME. Uh, I think I think like even just framing it up more and making that a little bit more palpable, if not concrete and well defined, but but sort of fleshing it out. And then the, the co-option of the term, the misuse of it. And I think open is a great case study here because, you know, like, like organic and natural foods, <clears throat> the term open has been like completely um, attacked in different ways who, by, by vendors who claim openness and yet, you know, they're not open at all. Um, <clears throat> I, had, I had a, one of the famous moments of my life is early in my career as a tech analyst, I, I read an article about IBM's image plus system our vice, our vice president comes back completely like scared saying, I just talked to the IBM dude in charge of Image Plus. He, would, he had your article in front of him all marked up in red. You need to talk to him. <clears throat> we then have this conversation where out of his mouth, starting the conversation is, I think we mean different things by the same words, the word open and strategic. And in my piece, I'd written that Image Plus was neither open nor strategic. And in his world, inside of IBM, it was very open and very strategic relative to everything else and only inside their little world. And he had, he understood what I meant by them and wound up subscribing to my research service. He wound up becoming a client. I, I, I almost didn't have to talk during the call. We made friends, the same as Dave, Dave Liddell, uh, et cetera. But, but that was a really big wake up for me. In, 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 uh, first, in responding to bad news. Uh, you know, Not all bad news is really actually bad news. Sometimes it's just opportunities. Uh, but also that open, 
could mean so many different things in so many different contexts. It's very contextual. And so, so I have a concern about OGM is this nascent thing that I, I think if you scratched six frequent visitors and participants in OGM, we would have six different definitions of even what OGM is. And I, I, I'm, I'm, that sort of worries me, but sort of not. I love the idea of it being an evolving hashtag, the way Black Lives Matter has Blue Lives Matter and All Lives Matter as a, as a negotiating space in society for, okay, what do we actually mean by these things? And why is All Lives Matter not a good inclusive substitute for Black Lives Matter, for example? That's a super interesting conversation that was provoked, that has happened. I don't know that everybody absorbed it, but, but that's really interesting to me. So, so the, the edge cases are actually ways that you define the term and the use of the hashtag. So that's kind of cool, but I don't know how that, how that plays out. I, I think that that variety of meanings and, and being co-opted and stuff, it's a sign of maturity and a sign of interest. Um, so it's kind of like, I, I, I always think of um, computer viruses or spam are, are a scourge, of course, but it also, um, it wasn't until email was important that we had spam. Um, so it's a sign of maturity that you've got an ecosystem and, you know, ecosystems have um, parasites and, and, you know, bad actors and things like that. And, and if the ecosystem is healthy enough, you know, you, you tip the balance and, and end up with mostly good. Um, another, another movement that comes to mind is actually Linux. Um, uh, and Linux is kind of, uh, I, there's some interesting things about it. There's, there's kind of a centralization around, uh, Linus Torvalds. Um, and you know what, he's a benevolent dictator for life kind of of Linux. Um, he's, he's held his position pretty well. I think he's pretty good at, um, making good judgments. And, and recently when he realized he wasn't as cool a person as he thought he was, he actually publicly said, you know, I'm, I'm going to step away a little bit and try to be a, a better person. Um, uh, but at the same time, Linux has really grown by leaps and bounds. And it's while it still has somebody owning the, the trademark and the name um, and even the kernel, um, it's, it also has gotten so big and so broad that um, that it that it acts like a movement more or less. Uh, so that's maybe a, an interesting hybrid of uh, an organization and and a um, and essentially a hashtag. I, I another way to to come at this is what if uh, OGM were an organization, right? So I think organizations have um, uh, they have uh, membership. Um, so you're a member of an organization and membership rules. Uh, if you break rules, you get kicked out of the organization. Um, you may have to satisfy requirements to be in the organization. Maybe you pay dues, maybe you don't, but maybe you subscribe to a certain um, channel of communication. And that means that you're a member. And if you don't, then, you know, either a announced mailing list or, or a chat system someplace. Um, and then what does, you know, what does the organization do for its members? If, if you say that this is an organization and here's the leadership of it, maybe it's one person, maybe it's a fuzzy set of people. Um, what's the responsibility of the leadership to the organ to the, the members of the organization, right? If, um, uh, if this organization wants to make a deal with another organization, you know, then, then you're talking organization, organization, how does that affect the members? Are the members affected by a relationship with another organization? Um, if the organization gets in trouble, uh, am I in trouble as a member? Um, if the organization doesn't have the belief system that, that I do, are they, if they're doing something crazy, what's my recourse inside the organization to change it rather than to just leave? Those kinds of things. And those become all responsibilities of an organization. Yeah, right, rights and responsibilities um, in um, both ways, both directions. Again, I, I wonder if we're confusing. I mean, like I have a hard time with Linux as a movement, unless we just use Linux for many different things. And clearly Linux is a piece of software, right? It is a product. Um, there, I, maybe we could argue there was a movement that led to the creation of Linux. Um, but then I just feel like we, we're using movement in so many different forms. So even your, the description of organization, there are organizations that have patterns of behavior, they're open or closed, right? 
Um, or, you know, so then as, as they get more and more open and become networks or something, do they evolve from being a, an organization into something else? Or are they, you know, if it's a DAO, is that what's, you know, what kind of an organization is that? Um, but I don't still don't know how you get from there to, to movement. Um, I just feel like the, the term starts to lose meaning. How, it's, how it's, about um, Black Lives Matter? Is that a movement or? Black Lives Matter, I would, Black Lives Matter to me seems like a perfect example of movement and in part because it's many organizations adopting a concept. So what you're trying to do is see the, the concept become um, more widely adopted and enforced. And so lots of people took on different aspects of what it means for Black Lives to Matter and went after policing or uh, racism or, you know, all kinds of different dimensions of that broad concept, but were unified around that slogan. So, you know, yeah. the meme kind of, it was, or you organized around the meme, um, maybe just the way to say it, but, mm -hmm. yeah. um, um, and there was, you know, an original <clears throat> hashtag, we can identify the person who did use the first hashtag, um, you know, she's gotten some credit as being the founder of the movement, which seems pretty bizarre, but you know, it coalesced around her, I guess, just as well her as anybody. Yep. Um, but the, clearly the ideas had been fomenting for quite some time so that the, the hashtag, you know, allowed a, a catalysis or something, right? I, and out of the, the similar thousand hashtags that, that could have been, that was the one that, that was mimetic enough to have multiple people saying, yeah, I'm going to sign up for that movement too. Um, verse, and it was a better branded movement than defund the police, <clears throat> which is a, a lovely idea with a terrible name um, that, that is going to, you know, has the possibility of actually damaging uh, pro progressives uh, as we go forward. Let me do the one minute version of the history of Linux because I think it's really instructive here. Um, so Linux starts as Unix, which is an assembly of utilities, a grab bag of utilities that happened to work well together, that created, and everybody else correct me in where I break this history, um, created at AT&T's Bell Laboratories back in the golden age of Bell Labs. <clears throat> because AT&T is under a consent decree that it cannot sell anything around computers, it has to give up <clears throat> this thing and it just gives it to universities. It says, well, here you go. Uh, which is kind of cool. And universities can't, don't have any budgets to spend money on operating systems or whatever else. So like, hey, this is really cool. We'll do it. And then Unix starts to get really messy. And you get a bunch of variants, including Berkeley and BSD. You get a bunch of sort of variants of Unix. Then the government says, we like Unix, but there's no standard. So they create a POSIX <clears throat> standard, which then proceeds to fail for a decade. Then you get a bunch of vendors coming in with their own flavors, HP UX, IBM has AIX, I collected a bunch of them in my brain, but each of them really doesn't uh, interoperate well. And the Unix world is kind of messy and ugly at that point, and that doesn't really work. Then this hobbyist named Linus Torvald says, hey, everybody on this list, I don't mean on, on Usenet, I don't even know where he started it, um, says, hey, I'd like to create a version of this Unix thing that works on my, on my PC. Uh, if you cooperate with me, the, the results will be under the GPL and will therefore be usable to everybody. That thing takes off. And then we get Linux, a grab, which should be called GNU Linux, uh, if you listen to Richard Stallman, uh, and it's a grab bag of utilities that actually works. And then IBM comes in and says, oh, this is really cool. And I have a whole story because I interviewed a guy, happened to interview the right guy at the right time of how IBM saved its ass by adopting first Apache, then Linux, then open sourcing their Eclipse system to jump into open source. And then you get Linux distributions which take the flavors of Linux and then layer them into sort of stacks and accompanying tools that work in particular environments for particular um, uses like real-time transaction processing or banking or what have you. And the distros, and I don't know the distros one from the other, I can't distinguish them, but they create markets to make businesses selling this open source piece of software and all of them, IBM and all the different vendors have people they're paying full time to work on Linux, improving the thing that's in the commons in between them to make it better and better. At which point we can say that there's something like a Linux movement and a Linux industry. Uh, sort of concurrently, which is really interesting because it, it, so despite a whole series of detours and bumps in the road, um, it actually turns into a completely fruitful, I think to this day, environment. And three quarters of the servers you hit when you click on a web page uh, are running Linux, I believe, and Apache. Um, what did I screw up in that history? It's pretty good. And thanks, Jerry. I, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I appreciate David saying that that it doesn't, you know, it doesn't meet the movement requirement. 
Um, I think that makes sense um, in maybe a, a larger societal view. And I think it also makes sense to call the movement a uh, technology movement. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you know anything about computing kind of, or if you're in the computing world, when you're working in the compu computing world, um, uh, Linux is in so many places and so, has had so many people contributing to it kind of, and not, I don't mean just contributing source code, but essentially misusing it almost, um, you know, it, it's, it's in, into lots of little embedded systems. It's the backbone of big web servers. You know, it's, it's everywhere kind of, and it, it feels to me, it, it has that same feeling of Black Lives Matter that, you know, there were enough people who kind of believed in it and enough different people, really very different people, um, uh, making use of it uh, in ways that were always Linux but um, also extremely variable depending on the context that they were they were in. So, I, Dave's Dave's point makes a lot of sense to me, and you know, I and I can also say that it, it makes sense to call it a movement separately. Then, so Apache to me is a tool, a piece of software. Um, it didn't change the world in the way that um, Linux did, even though Apache is super big and super well deployed. It's it hasn't been. Misuse, misuse is the wrong word, but Linux has been, Linux has gone places where nobody ever thought it would. Um, and it, it's used in, in many different ways that are just like strikingly different. And Apache is always Apache, so. Um, there, there's an interesting book uh, by Neil Stevenson. Uh, in the beginning was Command Line. It's a short book. Um, you can find it on the web and rip it off. Um, and I think Stevenson doesn't mind too much if you do that. Um, but he talks about the difference between uh, Linux and uh, Windows, Microsoft, Microsoft and Linux. Um, and so one of the interesting things is he talks about the, the way that a closed system like Microsoft, which is kind of like an organization, has to be, has to protect its image and it has to you know, it has to pretend that it's high quality. So he talks about how Microsoft is really hard, Microsoft Windows, it's really hard to find the bug list for it. You know, and Microsoft will say things like, it doesn't have bugs, or I'm sorry, you're, you know, we, we don't, you know, we didn't, didn't find that bug or whatever. Um, and then conversely, Linux, on the other hand, um, uh, you can see the bug system out in public. It's one of the things that you bump into first. If you want to say that there's a bug in Linux, you can say it. and um, you'll get, get celebrated for it, not not um, you know not hidden, um, and so that uh, uh, that willingness to be co-opted and misused um, and um, and made fun of and um, and uh, complained about is you know it's a uh, it's it's a superpower and a a, a you know, a, a hallmark of a good ecosystem. <clears throat> That's kind of where, where Neil Stevenson lands with it. You know, um, you're going to have a, a nice, healthy, robust operating system versus a kind of crufty, um, stilted, uh, held together with bailing wire, but you, you, you put lots of spray paint on it so it doesn't look like a kind of operating system. And I, to go, come back, a, a lot of that is the difference between open source and um, proprietary systems or or the bazaar on the cathedral um, in Raymond terms. Um, and uh, back to David's, Dave's point, um, a lot of Linux is really just an implementation of open source, the open source concept, the open source movement. And, you know, they, they, they actually, I think they did do a fair amount of co-evolution, but um, the, the background thing is open source and the open source movement. There's a, there's a fun moment in the history of open source and Linux and stuff like that where Steve Ballmer uh, says, aha, I had my people go look at, you know, Linux, and it dis they discovered that only like a dozen or a hundred people did most of the code in it, and there's like th th tens of thousands of people who did nothing, and it's like, mm -hmm. it's exactly how it works, and I think it's Clay Shirky uh, who talks about the membrane that surrounds open source projects versus the wall that surrounds proprietary companies and how those things work, and that really opened my eyes way back when in that any idiot can come in and download all of Linux for free and they get to go experiment with it, learn about it, do whatever on their dime. And then they can come back having done something and maybe having a valuable contribution. Whereas 
every employee you've hired to work on Windows had better be productive because they've got benefits and an office and everything else. And they're dedicated to this thing. And you've got to divide up the problem into little tiny slices because you can't have everybody working on the really juicy problems, you know, uh, together. And so you have to make a choice about who the architect on top is going to be. And that gets rid of everybody else's architectural suggestions, unless there's some insanely progressive way to get good ideas bubbling through a hierarchical organization. But, but it's lovely. But that's where the process comes in. I mean, you can build processes that enable that twingling of different ideas and viewpoints and there's a procedure to do that in terms of an initial vision a shared and ratified and molded to something slightly different vision a potential path toward it which is experimentally pursued and then when it doesn't work for some reason you reassess what forces cause that path not to work and you redirect energies to other approaches and it's very organic when it works and it can be taught, teams can be facilitated to do that. And that's part of what I think is at the root of OGM behavior is this sharing of knowledge and capacity to create change and outcome in an open community um, where it's recognized and valued, but not taken advantage of in a, in a negative sort of way. There's no misappropriation. There's attribution. How, how, how could there be no misappropriation though? Doesn't that just naturally happen? Say more about what you mean. Uh, anybody can come in and say, oh yeah, we do this. I mean, yeah, they can say, oh, of course we do. Oh, the, we do this thing over here, which is totally Imitation's not. the best form of flattery, you know? Yeah, but, but it's a problem because it blurs the boundaries of what happens and it, and it potentially can be crippling to the entire notion. Well, it depends on the set of sense of ownership you have. I mean, if you have a particular copyrighted approach or a certain vector, I mean, the nature of science is that you only own the experiment you did that you published because somebody else is immediately gonna take that information and do something else and create a vector that may align with your original vector or may deviate rather harshly. And to me, that's part of the wisdom or opportunity of wisdom in OGM is that continuous vector realignment that optimizes and things will fail. Some people will take it in the wrong direction and then they'll go, well, that sure didn't work. <laughs> um, I, think I don't it's... know if I'm answering your question, Jerry, because I, I get caught up in the whole thing about the shared community being more important than the ownership and attribution. Um, in terms think... of the... I think you end up with with protection, uh, com community based protection, right? The community says that's you know that's not open global mind, you know, and and actively squelches it. Um, or you can even say, yeah, it is. or people can be excluded from the group if they're egregious enough in their behavior because well, clearly they're values aligned. So that's that's true in an organization, and it's not really true, and it, or, or it's socially true, but not practically true in a movement, right? So when somebody's in Black Lives, somebody says, I believe in Black Lives Matter, I've got a hashtag Black Lives Matter shirt on. Um, you know, and they do something that's not Black Lives Matter, how do they get kicked out of the organization? They can't really, right? But they can get shamed um, and they can get, uh, they, can, they can maybe even um, inspire a counter movement, right? This is a person that we don't believe in, you know, bad, bad, you know, hashtag bad actor or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can kick somebody out of an organization. You can't really kick them out of a, a movement. You can shame them uh, in relationship to a movement. But also, if the original movement doesn't have enough critical mass, <clears throat> it might be overwhelmed by somebody who just co-ops the, the, the yeah. hashtag. Yeah. So that so that if there's like a couple dozen of us sitting here saying, hey, we think we're, you know, hashtag OGM and some big company comes in and spends a whole bunch of ad budget on it and does whatever else and says, nope, we're OGM. It could look like on the out to the outside world, like they had it first and they could just like wipe us out. Not not that this is going to be that important that somebody's going to try to do that, probably, but that's easy, that's easily imaginable. I, I can kind of remember open source community forks like that where um, somebody 
and actually right now it's audacity um audacity is in that spot um audacity is a, a sound editing tool audio editing tool uh, that's been open source for a long time and it got the assets got bought basically and and um the company who bought it started putting uh adware or spyware or something in it um and then the community is forced with the fact or, or forced to the realization that their tool that they called audacity is now not the same tool um this happens you know not not infrequently in open source communities where a community is taken over by somebody that is not in the original spirit maybe it's one of the original founders who was always kind of uh, wacko or maybe it's maybe it's an external party like audacity um, what happens in those things is you get a counter movement right you get something called real audacity or somebody will change the name and call it something else and then uh, it's put to a social vote right um, uh, you shame the people who are using the the, the tool that went crazy and uh, you reward the ones that are have the original spirit and maybe the sometimes the, the name changes, you know. Um, uh, in either case, some, sometimes the rift is healed and they they all decide to come back together. That's that's probably what happens mostly. Um, uh, but in either case, it's very traumatic um, and it can extinguish uh, movements. Um, but it can also be generative and create you know more more interest and more um, more activity. Anyone else want to jump in? Stacy, Bill, yeah. Michael, Phil. Phil, how's the move going? Uh, it's going um, in the middle of a mountain of laundry, basically. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Mm -hmm. um, I was just going to um, jump into the like the the movement movement versus organization question um, from the point of view of if it's a membership organization um, that is low barrier to entry, uh, well, I mean, I guess, I guess the, the question if, if we're if we're if we're living in in the the hashtag happily in the hashtag movement world now I'm supportive of that um, if we're talking about that versus some kind of organization and therefore getting into the what that organization could be um, I think there are some questions there and I just don't want to go there if it seems like I think that's interesting territory if you want to take us there. Huh? Well, I mean, just the conversations that I think um, you and I and Stacy have had and and others of us have had about, um, you know, OGM being an organization that that could be a, a few of the things on that long list that I put in the mattermost, you know, that are that are more um, Cohate than um, than a movement or a religion or but you know that we're we're an entity that can be named that would have a website that could have members and non-members that um, that could uh, accept donations or 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 earn income as an organization as a for-profit organization that could be a co-op that could be all those different things. And there are just a world of questions, most of, most of them having to do with, um, you know, with, with business model and IP and, and what, what kind of stakes of what sort people hold that you get into there that you completely take off the table if you go, we're a movement you know, living around a hashtag and, and trying to just make this happen that way. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a proposal particularly. I mean, I, you know that 
that I sort of tend toward the um, OGM not being a for-profit business, uh, if, it, if it is an organization being um, a, a nonprofit that perhaps you know, grants money to other entities, but you know, I, I I don't even I only pitch that against the kind of for profit um, model, um, not against the hashtag model. And just as a tiny bit of background before passing the floor to Pete, um, the reason for this call is that in our long road with uh, Lionsburg heading maybe towards something called steward ownership, we signed a memorandum of understanding with a tiny little entity called uh, OGM uh, Bootstrap, which is basically sort of a, just a, a, a dissolvable vessel for me. Um, and there is a, this MOU basically makes OGM Bootstrap a fiscal sponsee of Lionsburg, which is a 501c3, which is uh, qualified in all 50 states in the US which is really interesting because it's very difficult to actually be a charity that's registered in all 50 states. Um, but that means that OGM uh, bootstrap could go solicit funds for something. And like that, I'm kind of stuck on that sandbar because like if OGM is a movement, but not an entity, then what is the entity and how does that work? And that's a different discussion. But this call was originally going to be around uh, what is the entity relationship agreement that participants with OGM would have, which was Pete's excellent question, like what is a, how do we answer that in a fact file format? Um, and sorry, I've got, I'm in a room that needs me to move around a little bit. Um, and so we morphed that question into this question because if it's, an, if it's a movement, not an org, then a lot of these things, as you just said, Michael, right now dissolve. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't become problems. We get another set of problems with how do we corral and manage a movement? And also I get the problem in the middle of what am I pitching to whom and how do I describe that entity, whatever it is living inside of the ecosystem, which I'm happy to try to do, but that, that's what I'm facing right this minute. It's like, I need to explain this thing to people in a way that they're like, shit, that needs to exist. And I want to back it. Uh, Pete. Uh, thanks. So I, I, can, I, can talk about, I can talk about my vision of where this goes. And I don't mean to say that that's the only place it could go or that it's the best place it could go, but it's the way I think about it. Um, for me, there would be hashtag open global mind. Um, we would actually dismantle openglobalmind.com uh, in favor of the hashtag. Um, and then you would see what we think of now as OGM as several different um, more formal organizations with a smaller charter. Um, so I can imagine uh, something that we call OGM fund. I don't know that it would be called OGM fund. Maybe it would, maybe it wouldn't. But uh, OGM fund could be a fairly tightly scoped organization um, that has a bank account um, and a relationship with Lionsburg that helps it get funding. Um, and has a relationship with, with donors. Um, it does fundraising activities with donors. Um, and OGM Fund, uh, you know, ogmfund.com, maybe ogmfund.org um, would market itself, OGM Fund, or, or maybe hashtag OGM Fund at ogmfund.org, hashtag Open Global Mind. Has that Open Global Mind hashtag um, but it's not owned by Open Global Mind. It's not uh, the purpose of Open Global Mind isn't to distribute funds, yada, yada, yada. This little organization called o OGM Fund is the thing that distributes funds, collects and distributes funds. Um, there might be something else called um, uh, so something that uh, something that uh, works on software and standards for uh, personal knowledge bases and collaborative knowledge bases. Um, that could be called Free Jerry's Brain. Um, it could have freejerrysbrain.org um, or maybe freejerrysbrain. I don't know, collective sense commons.org or whatever. Um, uh, and then when it talks about itself, it would say, um, we believe in personal knowledge management. We believe in collaborative knowledge management. We believe in collective knowledge. Hashtag open global mind. So Free Jerry's Brain doesn't have to be part of 
an open global mind organization. It doesn't have to have open global mind in the name, but when it, when it talks about itself in plenary, it says hashtag open global mind. We belong to the movement of open global mind. Say, same thing, right? Um, uh, maybe there's a organization working on soil health and regenerative agriculture. Um, let's call it community food systems. Community food systems um, doesn't care too much about collaborative, collaborative tools, um, except it uses them a little bit. Um, uh, it doesn't force, you know, everybody else that thinks they're open global mind to to have regenerative agriculture as their core. But community food systems is all about um, regenerating soil health, you know, and it, that's the things it works on. But when it promulgates itself, at least in certain parts of the world, it would say community food systems, you know, hashtag community food systems, probably hashtag open global mind, because we believe in the open global mind values and principles and yada, yada, yada. And it's easier for us to say hashtag open global mind rather than saying, here's like 50 different things that we believe in, right? We believe in openness, we believe in collaboration, we believe in yada, 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 right? I've, I've distilled all of that down, even though I'm working on community food systems, I believe in a, a chunk of, of mind space called open global mind. And I, I say that, right? And I, I belong to that. And if somebody says, you know, what's this open global mind thing? I don't understand what that has to do with soil. I can tell them, you know, it helps me work on soil health when I'm working collaboratively with a bunch of other people in an open global mind. When somebody says, oh, yay, that open global mind, I, I heard about it from you. Um, I'm going to use it for my, um, acquisition and uh, in enclosure uh, patent IP system. And I'm gonna be going, no, that's not open global mind. And I'm gonna go get my buddies and we're gonna beat you up. We're gonna tell you that that's not the thing to use. We're gonna encourage you not to use it. We're going to start shaming you. Hey, this guy, uh, yada, yada, is using this hashtag the wrong way. Uh, you know, hashtag bad actor or whatever, right? So, so that's the way I see it. I, I love that picture. Where does your average muggle in the world, once they first see the hashtag, go to find out what the hashtag means? It's, it's kind of the same answer uh, as Black Lives Matter, right? Not really. I'm not sure it is. Um, how, how so? So so in my mind, somebody sees community food systems or whatever, right? Um, uh, drone systems for global internet, hashtag open global mind. Um, it's like, well, that's weird. So the first thing I do, and I'm weird, so maybe this isn't the first thing most people do, but the first thing I do is either I click on it and whatever system I'm in is, has auto-linked it. You know, if I'm in Mattermost, um, it, it's auto-linked it to other things about the same thing. And I, maybe I don't see the fact about what open global mind is, but I see some other instances of open global mindness, right? Oh, wow, it's not only a drone system, but it's also a community food system. And it's also a personal knowledge management system. Well, that's weird. But at least I get a picture of, you know, okay, I kind of get what Black Lives Matter means. I kind of would get what open global minds means. It's something kind of expansive. I think most people at some point will say, hey, Siri, what's open global mind, um, or they'll type that into their search engine or whatever, right? Um, and their search engine will return a bunch of the results. And if the open global mind people, sorry, I actually do have one Siri next to me. Um, I figured, I was uh, wondering if that was gonna happen. It's pretty brave, right? How does she answer the question? Uh, she's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, oh I don't man. Know. Something, I don't know. Um, uh, You'll, you'll type it into a search engine. If, we've, if Open Global Mind has done its job well, and this is an interesting thing, right? If Black Lives Matter, you know, who's the organization that did that? Who is the person who set up the fact? Who are the people who built the Wikipedia page? Who are the, you know, it's not one person, it's not one team. It's a bunch of people who are attracted to the vision and wanted to explain it to other people and wanted to, to support it and help it and protect it. Um, so you type it in a search engine, open global mind, you know, you get, um, you get a fact on creative sense commons, uh, collective sense commons, you get a fact on, on community food systems. Why is community food systems part of open global mind? Or why do we believe in open global mind, right? And then, you know, it says, well, community food systems is built on these principles. And these principles resonate strongly with open global mind. So you find, you know, in the 
relative or the irrele irrelevance search engine mind of the internet, you find out what open global mind is, or you find out what Black Lives Matter is. And if you actually have decent at it, if you're either, you know, 20 or under or um, an infovor, um, you actually start to see the bad things too, right? Black Lives Matter is when white people get together and have a great time. And you go, well, that's weird. You know, so you dig a little bit more, you find the Wikipedia article, like your, your high school teacher told you to. Um, you start reading up and you go, okay, you know, you get a list of the, the times, uh, Wiki, there's some Wikipedia article or whatever, it says the times Black Lives Matter has been misused. Here are the variations of Black Lives Matter. Here's all lives matter. And here's the explanation of why that's not inclusive. Here's blue lives matter and all about that, you know, and so you get a whole picture and that's, that's what we do in this day and age, you know, you, or, so I guess the, the other thing is muggles, uh, I, many muggles, many muggles know to ask their teenager, right? Um, honey, what does black lives matter mean? And, and the teenager goes, ah, oh, yeah, I, you know, it's a big story. Let me sit you down. Let's get some uh, beverages. Let's talk through it, right? And you get woke, right? So open global mind, same thing. I like that, thank okay. you. But, and, and I guess I still feel like you're, you're still describing open global mind as a meme that you want to have penetrate, right? You want this to have a viral impact. And, and then you've got a set of strategies that you hope will help it penetrate and you've got a whole a set of ideas that you hope it attaches to kind of I have problems with it like because that means like black lives matter is like a principle a statement of principles open global mind I guess could be a statement of principle it's also kind of a thing it could be a thing it's, it sounds a little nouny so maybe there's a wordsmithing problem with the meme I don't know but but you know I'm from from the okay so some sitting with trying to work with the global regeneration collab right trying to just make the equate equate to equate these things I think of regeneration as a movement. It is a meme that represents a better future, right? It has a whole bunch of organizations in the world who are interested in the better future. I think all of those organizations are involved in a movement. They may not recognize that or not, you know, and they're certainly not connected, right? So the movement does not have momentum. So GRC is an organization, it's a network, it's a community, it's a collab, it's something. It has boundaries, it's kind of porous, but it is a bounded thing. It is a part of the movement. Its role is to try to help uh, change makers be more effective, right, in that movement. It wants to deliberately connect with other parts of the movement to help tie the movement together, right? Um, and if we're successful, this future of regeneration will happen more quickly. Um, but, but we don't, you know, we're not gonna, I mean, I think it would be counterproductive to try to own the concept of regeneration because then the movement would happen more slowly. You know, I mean, there's kind of there's kind of pragmatic reasons for around ownership and positioning and stuff because if you do certain things, it, it constrains the meme instead of spreads it. Um, so you're almost making pragmatic, tactical decisions about which one, which way to go. I think. Um, and the fact of the matter is, I'm, I'm trying to run Google ads for this re, the speed networking thing. Oh, there's speed networking this afternoon. Regeneration pollination. It's really fun. Come hang out with other regeneration people. And oh, uh, except that I'm so I'm trying to run Google ads for this thing. And I can't get any click-throughs because I don't think anybody has any fucking idea what regeneration means or why they should care, you know? And in the Google world, right? In, in my little world, sure. But in the Google world, not, not enough. And, and I'm, I don't know how to re-wordsmith it to, you know, find people who might resonate enough so that, you know, they'll cl even click on the ad. Um, and so, I mean, I think, you know, we've got several layers of problem around open global mind ranging from it's really, really, really niche you know, so that the idea of movement behind it is very ambitious to, uh, you know, to understand what the fuck I, we want. I, I think I, I can let go of the word movement um, or, or leave it kind of floating in definition space. Um, you and I think of movement differently. So I wouldn't call regeneration a movement even. I, it's too diffuse for me to call it a movement. Um, and, and it's funny, I, it's close to a technology or, you know, a, or something like that, or, or a, a uh, a trick or something like that. But anyway, uh, I would be totally happy with open global mind being a meme uh, in your language. Um, and I think that's fine. I, I do agree uh, Black Lives Matter has a little bit better. It's, it's uh, the wordsmithing of it is a little bit more adject adjective instead of nounish. Um, but 
I think that's that's overcomable. Yeah. Um, so I think so the you know so the advice I would have around regeneration is that it's not focused enough, and you can't you'll never be able to get enough focus around it. Um, Whereas I think open global mind, the there's a there's a trick to getting enough words to uh, enough uh, yeah words together to make it have a directability or something or a focus. Uh, so um, I purposely named uh, collective sense commons um, in the spirit of open global mind. Um, you know, I it it's got a bunch of words in it that go well together and have a, a fairly specific meaning and evocative meaning. Um, uh, I actually sh shot myself in the foot a little bit um, because it's really supposed to be collective sense making commons, um, but that's just too long for a domain name um, practically, I think. So it's collective sense commons, which has, has a decent sound, but is words missed less well. It's a small um, hitch in the ointment or whatever it is, um, which is that BLM grew huge naturally because it makes sense, it's self-explanatory, and, and, and there's a lot of people whom it affects, um, I think. I mean, it got really gigantic. Um, it, it got gigan gigantic, but it makes sense because it's gigantic, not because it makes sense as a phrase. Oh, totally makes sense to me as a phrase. Like, like I, I read it and I'm like, oh, I, get, I, I kind the, of get what, what the, might be going on. The problem it has right away is, is that, what do you mean Black Lives Matter? Don't you mean all lives matter? I thought we were all, you know, equal opportunity or whatever. It, it's, it's come to mean a thing, but just, I think, Jerry, you and I are, um, you and I are both friends, distant friends of Reed Hoffman. Um, uh, I, I remember talking to Reed Hoffman and he said, I've got this new thing called linked in. And I'm like, link tin, what's like a tin of links? Like what? Like, I don't get it. But nowadays people who don't know Reed and people who know LinkedIn say, they will say, what's your LinkedIn profile, right? And I can still hear in my head, Pete of, you know, 20, whatever going, LinkedIn is a dumb name, dude. I, I'm not, I, I didn't say that out loud because I learned enough, um, uh, manners not to, to say that somebody's name is dumb because maybe it's not but I still don't I'm not crazy about the name but it's a thing right now and it's you know so I think yeah. that's that's true of Black Lives Matter too but, I don't I mean I, I don't think it's Google, intuitively obvious what it is but, yeah but the words Google and Yahoo were not part of the local, uh, vocabulary until companies decided to take really weird names for their for their companies and I think right. that's happened with Black Lives Matter too I think yeah. okay to most people it doesn't mean that much and it means contradictory kinds of things well partly I was bringing up at scale because being a nascent potential meme or movement maybe that's what we're that's what we are we're a nascent potential meme or movement a nap blah 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 um, being one of those, we're actually uh, vulnerable to SEO and SEM attacks, completely vulnerable to SEO and SEM, which means that a core competency of movement builders needs to be SEO and SEM, what? Which are, by the way, completely contrary to the I, ethics of OGM. I, it's, it's not, I don't, like, you're not vulnerable until, uh, to attacks until you're big enough to attack. Um, so you want to watch for accidental stuff, like, Regeneration, um, regeneration international. People are just going to stomp all over that by accident. Um, uh, open global mind. I don't think people will be stomping on by accident. And then if it's big enough to attract ten attention of uh, griefers, then it's. I think it's big enough to protect itself. Mr. Anderson. I don't know exactly what you've done to yourself, but you're close. You still need to unmute. <laughs> you did, you pulled a peak, which is like pulling, taking down your hand before unmuting and then getting like a little tangled in your shorts. Yeah, I'm going to have to get some embedded technology. So when yeah. I click on the screen, it undoes my, you know. You know, chipping. <laughs> We're all going to be chipped soon anyway. The vaccine. Um, uh, that you're more closer to the truth for me than you know. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so for me, whenever I mention some open little mind and you know, to my wife and others, although I don't, I'm not out and about as much as I used to be two years ago, just saying, um, it really, 
it pushes buttons because people go, what? I mean, it does, people, if you say it, people will go, I mean, it just, it's, it evokes things for people. It's meant to raise questions, right? Well, and it does. So I, I think that's terrific. Me and too. the thing about Black Lives Matter, when you all were talking, it made me think the thing that Black Lives Matter did, the way I see it is it pushed buttons, right? The black people, a few of them that I know, and I mean, they just like, like, damn it, I'm standing right in front of you. So you're going to look at me. And that's its power is right there. And it goes, don't you mean? It's like, just sit down and shut up. Well, you know, I'm going to say this once. <laughs> and you can go to the library and start reading, you know, whatever. Right. And, and so I think, so Open Global Mind sorry. does have that evo evocative thing, which I think is, it's, uh, uh, as Judy would say, it's a nice trait to have right now. And if you anyway. take if you take something like BLM seriously, you will go start trying to learn up. You will go do some history. And one of the best things I think we can do is help people get through that history well. Um, so if you say open global mind, people go, what do you mean? You go, hey, you know, I was confused too, but here's a couple of things to like, you know, little things to read that might help you think. I mean, I think of it, you know, I mean, I'm not going to live that long, long enough to see all make it happen, but this is like, I'm reading a history book about modernization and we are on the cusp the same way the world was in like the 1820s, 1830s. I mean, that was, you know, people say the what, industrial revolution started in the 1750s. There wasn't real industrialization even in Europe until 1840. So that's, there was other stuff going on in the world. And I think this is part of a discussion that's happening all over the world. And anyway, so that's one reason I think it's like, yay, I'm glad I found it. But I think that might be something to be able to say, you know, this is part of, we are trying to rethink, unlearn what we used to, the way we used to understand the world. Anyway, so I don't know what else to, I'm trying to write up some poetry about this. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Well, and that's, you know, I was trying to think of like, in terms of like regeneration, I'm not gonna, I'm not married to the term, but the concept of, you know, we actually are gonna have a better world instead of a worse world. You know, you have to have positive sum outcomes, not zero sum outcomes. You know, there's a, a whole set of kind of ideas that are embedded, which I think is similar in terms of Black Lives Matter. It's not one thing. There's a whole bunch of things that it represents, right? There's a bundle of ideas that are represented by the meme. I don't know, I'm not as clear on what the bundle of ideas are around open global mind. Um, and I, and I guess I probably get a little worried that they're kind of technocratic. They're kind of like, you know, if we, if we were philosophically pure enough in a certain way of sh information sharing and collaboration, good things would magically happen. So Black Lives Matter, I think, in, is a little bit more, you know, it's the black, you know, our lives, you know, like it's, it's a little more focused. So I think that, that helps with the motivation, I, I assume. There's a group of people who are devoted to this movement because it really represents them. The open global mind one might be a little bit more of a stretch to get people passionately involved. Um, the regeneration one has been too, I would say, although it feels like maybe people ought to get passionately involved. Um, but, but I do think, so the wordsmithing probably matters. And I think probably having a kind of a clear concept of what that bundle of concepts that you're trying to advance are, because that's probably what you have to defend with your SEO as well too, right? Mm -hmm. Judy? Well, I just had a, a, I don't know, a brain fart or a brain flash, I'm not sure which, but what if we had, if we changed open global mind instead of three words into open a globe with score lines and mind, where might that take us in terms of how we think about how it operates? It's an open mind, it encompasses the globe, it includes multiple representations, maybe we could consider a different way to represent the concept that would lead us to spin what it becomes in a different way. Like that in the Mattermost? 
I'm not in Mattermost because I'm on my tablet, so I can't oh, see. Oh shoot! <clears throat> I just did open a little emoji for a globe and then mine. Okay. Um, and and yeah, and Pete just put it in the Zoom chat. Thanks, Pete. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. It does it render properly? It does. It doesn't render properly. Shoot, I'll, the emoji I'll fix doesn't that. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering. Well, um, and if we wanted um, to get really dynamic, we could actually have a a global representation that rotates, which would be fine, just because it's in constant motion and it implies the connecting of all the pieces and other stuff. But it kind of took me in a good space personally, because what we want is an open community. If the globe is moving, people are moving. If people are moving, there's movement. So that makes it a movement as well. And thanks for, for fixing it, Pete. Um, thanks, Judy. Uh, Phil and Michael. Um, yeah, this has been covered a little bit, but one thing I struggle with with open global mind and relating it to a movement um, is that there's no action in the phrase itself. Like Black Lives Matter is a statement. That, that, that is a statement of, of something. Like Occupy Wall Street was a movement. There's, there's a verb there. It's, we're going to occupy this. This, this. this is a movement or this is a statement that we're standing behind. Open global mind is a thing. Like it's it's a. I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but it's open, like opening or like or creating a global mind or something. It's there's no action or statement. It's it's it's. I think it needs a tagline. If we if we do a graphic and a tagline, maybe we get there. But my sense of the open global mind is that we're trying to extract wisdom from every possible mind and put it in a place where it's retrievable and shareable. And in doing that, it becomes a movement because you're engaging the ideas of all of these different people. Yeah. Um, but I don't know exactly, that's the best I can do on a Friday afternoon at Premier. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it's, that's how I try to, I, because people say, what are you talking about, Judy? And I have to ex try to explain, well, this is a bunch of people who are good thinkers with a lot of disparate knowledge in different fields that come together to talk about things, to share their perspective from their unique point of view with other people who have different points of view so that we end up with a richer discussion. And that fits with my sense of the movement of what OGM should be. We should be inviting and encouraging that dialogue at every level in every place <laughs> in order to come to better decisions. I remember Jerry saying real early, doing this because we're making decisions without context. We don't know the background and the history and what led here, and we can't make the right decision if we don't have the context and the framing and the surrounding landscape, so to speak. So I don't know, I'm, I'm struggling with this a little bit, but. Yeah, okay. I, I agree. Yeah, just uh, the last thing I was gonna say was just that something like weave the world or knowledge weaving or something that is an action or something like even like Black Lives Matter is a statement because it had to be said, like there was, things were happening that, that were, we're basically saying that they didn't matter. So it had to be said, open global minds. I'm, I'm not sure where it falls. It's both like, it's not an action or movement and it's not. It, it depends on whether open is an adjective or a verb. If open is yeah. a verb, then it has the action momentum of opening minds in lots of different ways. Um, I don't know. I, it doesn't have to have that unique name. I'm just, I'm just trying to frame what it means to me, I guess, which is the opportunity to see situations from very different points of view than mine, from people who have actually thought about it and are not just quoting bad press that's distorted. <laughs> you know, they've done some vetting of that thought process 
they deliberately sought perhaps contrarian viewpoints to be sure they haven't missed something and what they're concluding. Um, there's that whole discipline of knowledge acquisition. And we've unfortunately become a culture that doesn't do that worldwide. The number of people who are taught critical thinking or encouraged to ask questions instead of make assumptions and statements is a lower number than I'd love to see. Michael, then Pete. You're still muted? Oh, yeah. oh there we go, good. Um, since we've gone here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna mention something. I, I actually just put this in the Zoom chat that I, I always figured at some point we'd, we'd get to some like sort of branding issues. <laughs> There's a problem with open global mind, which is that open mind and open mindedness are very much a thing. And it means something when you say open minded and when you talk about open minds, you're talking about um, not bringing your you know, preconceptions to it, like being open, be, be, being willing to see both sides, all those things, which are ways I'm sure we would like people to behave around the knowledge that, that our, our movement says should be assembled um, and shared and collaboratively, you know, um, vetted. Um, but I, I was, I, I'm sorry, I don't know if this is a finished sentence, but, um, but, you know, whenever any of us describe what open global mind is, we uh, explain away open minded by using words that I just heard Judy use and, you know, like shared and collaborative and connected and, and commons and, you know, cooperating and, and, uh, yeah, social intelligence, all, all those kinds of things. And if we're trying to come up with a memeable, you know, concept, I don't know if open global mind is the best thing for that. I mean, I, I've always felt like even in this conversation, coming into this conversation of the hashtag idea that the hashtag might not actually be those three words. I mean, I, I like those three words and I'm comfortable with them, but if, if I was sitting down in a room with a client saying, how are we gonna get this idea out into the world and get it to stick? Um, just like we wish somebody might've done with defund the police, um, we might do something different. Um, so I'm just putting that out there. <laughs> Um, thanks, Michael. And and I'm wondering. Oh, thanks, Michael. Thanks for nothing. <laughs> I, you know what? I appreciate you saying that. And I didn't know that you'd been harboring that that fear or wish or or trouble for for all this time. You like, I'm I'm really glad that it's on the table. Um, I have a different response to open mindedness. I find it as a uh, a wishful thinking kind of thing. I think that a lot of us would love to be more open-minded and be able to have these conversations, but I realize that a whole bunch of humans on earth may have a more toward your response to it. So I'm wondering who else on the call does. Can I just explain before other people are responding to it and yes. the way you just framed it, just explain to, I, I mean, open-mindedness, I do think is a good thing, um, but it's, it's, you know, um, it's pairing away, I think you, you would agree, we could agree that open-mindedness is um, being open to reception, like of, and, and not bound up by your preconceptions and, and like already being, being closed-minded doesn't mean being, doesn't mean a total, lack of knowledge it means you've taken the knowledge you want and that's what's that's what you're sticking to right i mean sort of it yeah. doesn't mean it doesn't mean uneducated it means firmed right. up in your beliefs i guess exactly exactly so I, I i think it's it's not i didn't mean to make it sound like it's dumb or something um, no, no no i i i'm perfectly happy to to say that cool. the countenance that different people have different interpretations of the phrase i just want to know what other people in this call think of, yeah. of the phrase 
Anybody else want to jump in? Wendy, oh my God, insomnia strikes. Um, well, it's just after five in the morning, 20 past, so that's okay. Four is a bit rich, but five is usual, so. <laughs> so you've just gotten up, you haven't stayed up. No, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would mean that I am slower than I should be. <laughs> Just that statement. We're, we're right in the teeth of uh, clean language. Ah, um, excellent. Whether open global mind is clean or not. So when I say clean language, that means something particular to Wendy. Not It's, it's maybe not, it's not necessarily a good hashtag for itself. Okay. So who's part of the conversation? I haven't opened up Zoom quite that much yet. Um, David. Ooh, there's other people. I haven't met lots of them, so. We should go around the room, maybe. Yeah, it's nice to meet some people. Uh, so, Jerry, you know. Um, yeah. Michael, you know. We have, this is our first real camera. Go ahead. Uh, Michael runs Factor um, and always says smart things um, and has just wondering whether open global mind and open mindedness mm -hmm. conveys the right thing. Um, Judy, you know, um, at least a little. Um, uh, Dave uh, is visiting, I don't know if that's the right word to say, um, Dave is participating from um, uh, the regenerative global regenerative, regenerative regeneration collab global something space. Um, Bill uh, just got his farm to uh, farm to farm to whatever farm to home delivery, um, so he may not be here. Um, Stacy uh, has wise and interesting conversations with us, um, and uh, Phil is moving and has lots of laundry. Um, <laughs> Phil works with Michael on Factor, and, and he's also spent a, a fair amount of time with OGM. Um, and uh, Jerry and Wendy and I have a have a date uh, to get together to talk about clean language and OGM, and and maybe the way to think of OGM and multi-dimensional space, uh, which Wendy can describe and I can't, yeah. And Wendy had sent me a paper by Max Boirot and a couple of co uh, colleagues about what these spaces look like, which Wendy, I have not brought up in this conversation yet because you weren't here kind of to represent it and talk about it. Uh, but I, I'm happy to screen share some of that if we wanted to head in that direction. But also we've been on for almost 90 minutes and that uh, that's coming up quite quickly. So we're coming up to the end of our, our planned yeah. call time. Yeah, I knew that would happen, but um, I guess it was a choice, wasn't it? So, <laughs> well, very happy you're here. Um, so, open to whatever anybody would like to suggest uh, for a next step. Um, Michael, conversation. <laughs> Michael raised the question: What? And and Jerry, you kind of echoed it. What does is open global mind good for people? Kind of crazy. Michael, do you want to recap real quick why you think open global mind might not be wordsmith's best? Sure. I, basically, that whenever any of us explain it, um, we're really talking about uh, connected minds, shared minds, collaborative, you know, the, the being able to link and, and often, as we talk about it, map connections between um, different particles of knowledge and get the benefit of the things that we can draw. And I think that it, it you know, I was actually, hadn't thought about this before, but I was just thinking about, Jerry, your brain. I mean, the last thing, though, though that you have made that brain open to us, it is, it is a very connected brain. And that's kind of the kind of brain where we want to build for, for everyone, where the, the connections and the organization and, and what you can, what it reveals is, is what you want to see, not general openness. Is my thought. Um, anybody else want to riff on that or, or come in on whether OGM has been working for you or not? And you know, were you following this? Phil. I mean, yeah, I did. Uh, sorry, Dave. Dave I've, I've spoken with you. Go ahead. No, well, okay. I, I, uh, the, I did see OGM coming out of Jerry's brain, I guess, which is probably one of the reasons I thought of it as a noun a little bit as a thing. So I probably, you know, kind of, so I, it's helpful. It's been helpful to hear the idea of, you, mm. doing, you know, um, and mm. it also occurs to me from the conversation that it, there's a ton of hubris in, in, the, in the notion that you're going to create a movement. Mm. Um, probably 
probably so much that it's not even really worth trying to pretend to do. You're either mm. joining one, right? Or, you, you're, you know, you're digging, digging off. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we're going to brand a movement. And so I don't think it really matters. So you're going to position yourself within a movement that you're hoping mm. is going to advance. You hope to become mm. successful, whatever. But you're joining a wave, right? It's the wave phenomena that's going to matter. And you don't get to dictate the direction of the wave. You get you mm. to splash around in it. Uh, Phil, then Wendy? Um, yeah. Oops, when, do you go, when, do, when do you go ahead? All right. <laughs> um, I woke up thinking I had hatchery and, hi and hydra as two sort of uh, metaphors. Uh, there are so many smart people in, in um, OGM, and I agree with the connections. Um, so rather, and I've, I've been part of this conversation in Human Factors before, where the model is either you are the thing or you support the thing who you support the people who make the things. So open global mind seems to have, if connections is the, the right word, it has its position to be able to help people keep connections clean, sort of as far as ontology goes, as far as um, IT goes, as far as, um, you know, the structures of other organisations go. I mean, what you are just has to be good at helping other people make what they want to go to because it will you'll never stand for all the things that people might want to build but you know if you take massive wikis for example you understand where wikis go wrong pete understands heaps about wikis and any organization actually needs to be able to build something that makes its connected mind it would be really good if they did what we did if what we did was really good and really clean but it might just be that you have to be really good at standing for that concept so that anyone else who makes an offshoot makes something that has a lot of the qualities of organisations that need to be able to remain connected. Does that make sense? You've got to be a really good example of um, the technology and the ideation that keeps an organisation connected over something that's important. People may not actually do the same thing that we're doing. But if we're as like a repository of people who know how to do that at the top level, if we're the best at doing that, then other people might stay with us to do their thing. But at least if they leave doing things that are clean, um, as far as, you know, some of the concepts in that um, article I showed you, um, Jerry, then you can't go too wrong because people go off and do their own thing. So rather than being the thing, sometimes it's good to be an exemplar of the thing, if that makes sense. And then people at least can come back to someone, an organisation that um, says, that, yeah, if you do wikis that way, we always knew it would go wrong. <laughs> because, you know, you, people will get lost in their own creation. It's what's happening all the time. And they're making good things, but those things aren't remain, remaining connected themselves. So maybe that's it. In human factors, it turned up as it's turned up as being: Are you supporting the people who are trying to make clean things, or are you the thing? That's pretty much what it resolves down to. And I think that's sort of a different path back into where this conversation started, which is: Is OGM a, a movement or an organization? Yeah, uh, you're, you're using yeah. different kinds of language, but it sounds like the same sort of concept. Yeah, it um, is. Do, do you mind? Do you mind? Just giving us a minute or so on clean, like what you mean by clean. Okay, so um, <laughs> clean as in as in clean language, and know that narrative yes. is sort of the middle strip of what we're doing. So there's two images that I would show with you to explain why clean, and while clean language is where the initial usage came from that I'm about to explain I'm talking about being in clean organization so you I'm using clean as a metaphor for what I just said is in you know best of brand in terms of the types of structures and um, technologies and other bits and pieces that were as good as we can see how to make anything um, right, as, a, so, as an so example clean, so clean means best of brand no <laughs> clean doesn't so I'll tell you what clean language is and then I'll use the word clean in another thing in a bigger sense okay that's probably going to make it easy Thank you. so um so 
when the word clean language came from a guy called Dave, um, Dave, David Grove, who was a, an, ex, an amazing um, um, counsellor that under, does his work, who came out of New Zealand. And um, if I say the word design is in position, <laughs> words are in position. Every time you say something to someone, you're positioning them to respond to a certain something that may not be their something, okay? Because you're using certain words, you're making certain assumptions. And so um, he discovered in his counselling that if he used a certain pattern of questions, those questions allowed the person to return their thing to you in the cleanest possible form. So um, what would you like to have happen is a classic question in, as an opening piece. Or what would we like to have happen um, as a result of this meeting? So result has implications that we want a result. We might not want a result. <laughs> and, and, and if you use these clean language questions, um, these, there's about 12 of them. They leave the space open for people to create joint metaphors or joint symbols that allow them to work as a group in the cleanest possible way because I haven't imposed my result on your result. We've negotiated what result means in the terms of our words. So we're not coming in with a dictionary meaning of result. Um, and that is really powerful because it means that at the very beginning of a movement or an organisation or a pair of people, you have jointly defined in ways that are ambiguous enough for you to be functional, but useful enough to be you know, quick and giving people an enduring set of words that they can continue to use and develop for themselves. So clean, um, there's clean, different people who've used this system, but clean language is the concept. And it's really powerful because it keeps people united over things that they would otherwise fall apart over. Language is absolutely one of them. It's what's called a semantic field. Yeah. So language is right at the heart of it all. Right in this meeting, you will have used language that will make you stay together or not make you stay together because you'll all have joint different understandings of what that words are, what those words are. So clean language has been used by, um, fully developed by people like, or, and it's continuing to be developed. James Lawley and Penny Tompkins are two people and they've got what's called symbolic language. So that would include things like maps and metaphors and such. And it's got more of a counselling feel. And then there's systemic clean language or systemic modeling and that's um kate caitlin walker and her crew and it's amazing in terms of if you participate using those sorts of ideation those sorts of processes um how you can keep an entity together or a group or a pairing of people or whatever the systemic modeling or an individual more functional because they don't have to put into dysfunctional words what they mean together because almost everything that they're making won't be fully formed and they just explode. <laughs> Thank so you. clean, the clean concept, and that's far too many words, but clean language, I would go Caitlin Walker um, and it's Caitlin Walker's systemic modelling and what they're doing is building a joint metaphor for what they're all collectively thinking and keeping that metaphor real for each of the individual's understanding of everybody else's understanding. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. Uh, but and clean is the concept then, if you take it up to the organization, it's got clean coding, it's got clean structures as far as management goes, it's got clean, everything's answerable to this joint metaphor or modeling, if that makes sense. So to tie the conversation just before about naming of OGM to what you just said, and, and I may be wrong here. Um, to me, Open Global Mind contains intentionally several different leading metaphors. Uh, mm. Hey, wouldn't we like to be open-minded? And it's kind of aspirational. What does it mean to be open-minded? Gosh, I might have to be vulnerable. It is all, it is meant to invoke that. And might we be creating or weaving a global mind? And what is that? And how does that work? And wouldn't it, wouldn't it be interesting to have some kind of global memory or, or brain or something like that? All of that is intentionally meant to be in the phrase open global mind, which seems to me to mean that it's as, as unclean as a phrase can get. Am I like missing the point here? Um, 
Yeah, because you're some. Well, let's start with where where knowledge is held. It's not just in the brain. The knowledge is held in your body. So that's why I'm, I want to like. I keep on wanting to bring this up, but you know, it's embodied knowledge, and people go. People are really fine with just embodied knowledge. That's sort of the bottom layer of this thing. <laughs> you know, the bottom embodied knowledge. There are people who get on perfectly nicely in the world, and and culturals. I, I'm not. I'm not screen sharing, and I could. Um, but these embodied knowledge is perfect in a in a in a, an organisation that doesn't need to be global, because you can't disseminate the knowledge. But I'm functioning perfectly fine. All my knowledge about what I eat, where how much I sleep, um, who I spend time with, um, how to do the skills and things like that that I need, they're all in my body. Why would I need to have them open, and why would I need to share them? Thank you. <laughs> so go to this one. Thank you very much, Jerry. <laughs> um, so embodied knowledge is fine, but you can't distribute it because you haven't got a body across the world. My body's in, in Australia, in Canberra at 5.30 in the morning, okay? So that is not, it's open to me, but it's not global, okay? And, and you cannot miss embodied knowledge. It's where thinking comes from. And then the, the top bit, the abstract knowledge, that doesn't mean anything to anyone who doesn't have a shared context. So it can't be global unless you have some sort of shared context, which is what this meeting is. So the narrative bit is the bit that strides, strides those two things. So that's where the stories and the words and the clean language is so important because without that strip, nothing connects up. All the bodies all over a all over the world will not connect up. Because what they know individually is just, it's not possible to be able to join it up. I'm confused about why the curve doesn't go down into the right first. Um, because I would assume that stories and narratives are the vehicles for diffusion of knowledge. Like that, that, yeah. that would be like the turbocharger. And the moment it gets too abstract, I would actually curve it back. It's like you lose yeah. a lot of It people. does curve back. And so that's part of a box. And I space this. So this is Max Boisseau's work, and it is really powerful. But what he's done is he's folded down two. No, it's not in that particular one because I didn't want to go quite that far. But this is the guy, okay? Um, so it's actually a, a space. It's, and what he's done, if you go back, um, the structure of the, the structured, unstructured bit is actually two dimensions, okay? Uh -huh. One is... Um, Abstraction and the other one is um, starts with C. Um, codification. 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 I know these are big words. I know this sounds academic, but it's so important. So it's actually a cube. And so he's folded those two things, codification. That's exactly what you do when you've got a wiki, is you categorize something as X and you put things into a box. And it's, you're asking people to link things together and then share them with other people. And they'll all link them and structure them in different ways. And therefore, you can't share them unless you're more abstract. That's what a meme is. It's, a, it's an abstract version of something that's been shared by people. But it's been collapsed into something that's funny and shareable. And they'll all take it different ways, but they can use it. So this structured, unstructured piece has got two dimensions. So it actually comes all the way up to abstract and then it comes back again, if that makes sense. So it is actually a cube. It does come back again, but it comes back again as a shared thing around the world. So my version of results and your version of results have this little fold thing in the middle in our conversation. It goes up to the top. We agree as a society what results are, make money, and then it comes back to me and my world. And it does this big cycle. And if you get the abstract bit wrong, which is what a global mind would hopefully avoid doing, if results means money, then everyone has to get richer. And that comes back again and I, it comes back to me and if, in my world. So you just got this big loop. But the narrative part in the middle is what we can do really well as long as we don't force... You want, you, if you force people to use your words, your structure... Um, Jerry, you could talk to this. I feel like I'm ranting. Um, if somebody had to use your brain structure, would they be able to step into doing that easily? Um, I've only met a few people who can go navigate my brain and be really happy doing so and have told me that when they hit a new topic, they go search my brain first because probably I've got some stuff there. There For them, 
the tool and the way it maps and the way I've used the tool work for the way they represent things in their head. A lot of other people uh, would prefer and would probably need my guidance or my storytelling over the brain so that I can say, first there was this, then there's this, and then that led to this thing. And I could tell stories like James Burke would tell you know, in his connection series, which was one of my inspirations, I, I have narratives that I can tell through the brain. So that works well. But as a freestanding thing, you have to be a couple of sigmas off the mean uh, to kind of just jump in and go, hey, this is easy. I get it. Yeah. But that's them navigating your brain. But the brain is a structure. It's like a narrative structure. You've just talked them through it. You've showed them how to use it and they've taken some. But if they needed to actually jump in and use exactly your brain, to do whatever they needed to do, like they just took your one and put things only in your categories and such, that would be hard for me because I don't think the way you think. Right. My abstractions are different to your abstractions. My categories, the way I shape everything is different to Jerry's thing. So I couldn't use Jerry's brain to think the way I think because my brain and Jerry's brain are not the same brains. So it's a really good example of why the brain is there. It's, it's a bit flawed because a lot of the things that I do are actually in my body and Jerry's brain and my brain are different and therefore I come up to the top and I'm not going to stick with you, Jerry's structure because I'm not it. So the brain, when you talk about global mind, the mind is all the way through the body, I guess is one of the points. And Jerry, can you just share that last one, that one about plans and things like that? I think that's probably useful. Um, which, which part? This over here? Um, that. Oh, sorry. Then, yes. Let me just. Yeah, oh, this one. It. No, this one's quite good as a pretext. So this, yeah, this shows the shape of it all. So um, it shows structured versus unstructured. So um, just loose and everyone doing their own thing is fights. <laughs> um, bureaucracy is highly structured, but it's not something that um, is diffused across the society. God help us if it ever did. Markets don't seem to be working particularly well in a lot of different ways, but people would say that they are or could, but I don't see open global mind as a market. I just see it as a sort of clan of clans. That's what I see my open global mind as. And all the clans have got all the ideas and the people and they've got some intersections between them. But this article just shows you how you can structure knowledge and structure organisations. So each of them are institutions and if you go back to the, um, if you go back to the graph, the table, that one, yeah, yeah, that one. Okay, so we're not fives. We don't want to be underfused, and we don't want to be unstructured because nothing will spread, and we don't want to be bureaucracies because they're impersonal and hierarchical, and you have to follow everybody else's goals, and they don't share values. That doesn't sound very sexy to me. I don't know about being a market, but relationships are important and we've got to share goals and you've got to share values. So that only leads to one thing that we could possibly be in the diffusion structure piece. And we're a bit unstructured at the moment. So I see us somewhere between a clan and a market. So you've got a structure so you can coordinate across. You share your goals. You share values and lead beliefs. Um, you're diffusing information, so you've got to be up a little bit. Um, so you want to put enough structure in what you do to be able to um, be closer to a market or something that's more, more than a clan but not quite a market. So it, it's and, – and narrative is at the heart of it all. So if you want to be global, you've got to be able to share information. That's the whole point. So you've got is to it, work out whether you're doing it as stories, you're doing it in abstractions, if you're doing it in structures or whatever you're doing. Is there a difference if, between a clan and a tribe? Are those the same thing? Um, I think a clan is, yeah, a clan and a tribe, I think are pretty, pretty close to the same thing. Um, there's other ones like um, oh, Dave Snowden talks about crews. Okay, so crews are about 20 people. Clans can have more than 20 people in. But this is where numbers really count because you can't stay connected if you have too many people. So it talks about your structure. So you could, oh, that's why I'm thinking clan of, uh, not clan, community of clans is what I'm thinking. Hmm. So you've got a community of clans that are similar enough to be able to do stuff together um, because they share a lot of values, but they're not exactly the same. And they're better at diffusing information because they've got, um, they've got shared values and they've um, got similar goals. 
but they're not exactly the same. But if you assume that you go up to markets, there's a little bit much of there's a little bit too much of we don't stand for what you stand for, and you just want to make a lot of money, or you just want to whatever. You don't share goals. You've got to share goals, and relationships are really important. So markets don't seem to be working. So there's only one of these four that, to me, seems to involve relationships. I mean, or to rely on relationships, and that's the clans, tribes. Um, yeah. corner. Every, everything else deprecates relationships in many ways or overrides or overrides them, right? Yeah. So the diffusion bit, because clans is clans have got a unit size, they're smaller, they're like 20s and 40s and things like that. You can keep your values close without having to, to make knowledge really abstract because you're close and you're having these conversations. So that's those two levels. You're close enough in proximity. So I'm not part of the American clan. Is there, how many people here are from America? Guilty. Okay, Phil, where are you from? Oh, I'm America as well, sorry. Um, I'm moving to London, but I'm America. Sorry, I had, I had a different question to ask, but you can continue. Okay. Well, like, and Stacey, I didn't see a hand. <laughs> um, but you can straight Stacey away. I think away. Yeah, I'm, I'm not American, and I'm the only person who isn't here. <laughs> and I know it's not time zones kill a lot of global things they just do if i respect myself i'm not getting up at four o'clock in the morning so i can actually say i respect myself now because i didn't get up at four o'clock in the morning i could have but i chose not to i was awake enough to be able to join this whole conversation so you know just time zones will kill relationships because i won't have had the same opportunities so anyway it feels like i'm ranting but th this max Boisseau is, is that's a really, really good article to start working out how you're putting some structure around things because you've got to diffuse information. You've got to share it. That's what open and global mean. But you can't, it's really hard to be global if you don't share values and you don't share time zones and, um, and you've got so much structure that you have to work all the way up and all the way down like a bureaucracy to get an idea across. So you're in a, the perfect time to be able to make something that, it comes as close to a community of clans as I've seen. But, it, you know, what you do over the next few months, we'll, we'll see whether you can manage to get over that. Anyway, I feel like I've just taken over and I didn't mean to. Um, okay. I'm just saying these things, are, these the people, that whole article, and this is just one, but this one's actually a really good one because it's got lots of things like simulation in it and this guy's talking about China and cultural competence in, of institutions. Is, so his, that's the whole, that's the middle part. And the whole thing is how, do, how does politics work globally and how's China doing? <laughs> that's, that's the setting. This is just the middle part of that whole thing. So he's talking about how knowledge is moving across the world and who has what sorts of institutions to support their thinking and their sharing and how's that working. And I'd say markets aren't working very well personally. I think markets are starting to collapse, but clans work quite nicely. Hello, Bill. Um, let's go to Phil. Yeah, um, and thank you very much, Wendy. That was, that was enlightening for me. Um, these are new concepts for me, so I appreciate um, the dive into it. One thing I kind of come back to a lot, and actually, Jerry, you brought this up. I forget if it was in your initial pitch or when we were talking about the pitch, but OGM as mycelia or mycelium, um, which I think is stronger than connector um, because it can res respond to stimuli. It can kind of dictate where nutrients go for like different projects. Um, in my mind, where OGM is a container, it's, mm. a, it's a space, it's a container for things to happen, but we ideally want to be like the action we're taking is that of mycelia. Um, so how we embody that. I, I was actually going to ask as well, Wendy, if there's any, so those, those are all societal structures. I was just curious if there's any delve into kind of organic structures. And, um, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so container, um, so if you think of it as a knowledge container, um, and I agree, I, I'd never go on mechanistic um, metaphors because they just fail. They just don't work for me. I can't do it. <laughs> um, so I think of, you know, you know, it's a, it's a venue, so it's a place where things happen. 
So it's either a container that is empty that things happen inside, which is um, in the clean language world, they use one of the organisations has called itself um, Metaphora, and, and that's from Amphora, which is container for metaphors, which is really quite nice. That's where the idea metaphor comes from Amphora, which means container. So that's why they use that word. It's a very clever word. They call it Metaphora, which is container for ideas and metaphors, which is a bit circular. <laughs> but that's something that's been made as a container. I don't know that the world has many containers. <laughs> Most of the time they're um, placed in space and they name the space. They, they don't name the venue. Um, like jungle, I, I think of jungle as a, a place that's got things in that interconnect um, and it's a bit wild, but it's still not a container. It's a metaphor and it's a, a location for rich things. So that's your other alternative. So this is a difference between place and space. A place has things that have culture and bits and pieces are connecting in the middle and a space is a, is a vacuum and nature doesn't do vacuums very well. It puts things in them. It just it abhors the vacuum. What was that? It abhors the vacuum. It okay. does. It allows things to come in all the time. So it um, wants things to come in. And you're reminding me that I uh, I was reading up on Kenevan, uh, and Kenevan was a book that Snowden came up with, kind of as a competitive alternative to uh, Nonaka's Ba, which means a context that harbors meaning, which is a lovely phrase. Yeah, uh, and Kenevan in Welsh is the place that that holds our our belongings. Uh, yeah. So very much the language that you're pointing to in both of those terms. Yeah, and it's cultural language as opposed to nature language. So it's impositional by definition. So, but Kenevan, uh, my family's Welsh actually, but they they were on the rich side of Welsh and bought days were on the poor side of Welsh, and we know we know each other personally. Um, so. I agree that the, the cultural piece um, is always going to be there with, it, which, with whatever words you use that come from culture. And you just have to have people getting agreeing that they like the meaning and then just using the word. That's what, that's what clean language negotiates, these clean systems. So you either bounce off the word because it's an American word and it doesn't mean anything to me or a Welsh word or a whatever. And as far as um, the shared context go, you know, that layered diagram that had embodied at the bottom and abstract at the top, you can't get out of the embodied bit unless you have some sort of face-to-face -face shared context. Narrative is hard to use. We're all talking in English. <laughs> okay. And our shared context is Zoom. And that's as good as it gets at the moment for all of us. Um, so our shared, I know, our shared context is not enough. Like you're going to, and if you, you don't know what the jungle is because you live in a desert. <laughs> so a really big piece of this OGM quest is to discover, invent, prototype, pioneer, something or other, a new shared context that is more palpable, visual, connective, something like that. I don't exactly even know how to say it, but I'm, I'm like, there's a, there's a thing here that we're missing that yeah. will allow us to share our, these ideas so that you don't have to hold up a sheet of paper and me share a PDF file and us share a bunch of little links in the chat, but rather we start weaving this thing actively together. Um, yeah. We don't have it yet. We're not there. Yeah. So yeah, that would be a good way of putting it. And whatever you call it, people will bump off straight away because they won't get that thing. They won't go from their own little embodied local thing into the bigger thing because they won't get what the thing is. You can't name it in something, you know, metaphors as close to it as you get. That's why clean language is so important. It keeps people in a space together while they learn to get each other. And so, it's a hugely struggle. It's a huge struggle. So is clean language important at the beginning of relationships, but then naturally what happens when people enter relationships and build trust and context is that they develop shared metaphors and their language gets unclean? Well, it does to a certain extent, but they've got, they use the clean language as part of their piece. So um, so when you said results, so you say to me, um, I want a result today. And I'd say, what sort of result is that result? And you'd say, it's a result that's tangible. Um, 
and I say intangible and results. And we'd start to get to, you want to report. I'm thinking, okay, right. You, that's the result that you want from today is a report. It might be minute, minute meetings or whatever. And for me, it might be, if you were doing it to me, I might say, what sort of result? You might say, what sort of result? And I think it's a relationship. It's that I grok you. Oh, you know, not tell me more about grok because that's not quite the right words. But what sort of grok is that grok? Oh, you know, Hein, um, what's his name's book? You know, <laughs> you know the book. Grok, does everyone understand? Yeah, you, you yeah, yeah Heinlein. 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 And, yeah, thank uh, you. No, it's not Heinlein. It's, um, it is um, the water person, the guy, the desert thing. Um, the desert thing. Yeah, the I desert think it's thing. It's where everyone's dying thing. and when you die, you get your water gets given to someone, so your water brothers. I can't remember Dude. what the name of it so is. So it comes from Stranger in a Strange Land. Thank you. Um, okay. which, is Heinlein, which is Heinlein. Yeah, it is Heinlein. Okay. So I grok you. So I get you at some level where our shared context is is not as important because I get you so much that I will stay in this space until we work out what it is that we need to jointly work out. Now, they're two different outcomes. For you, result is a bit of paper that I read. And for me, a grok is a relation. Result is a relationship. And if we don't get that straight at the very beginning, I'm about relationships, you're about reports, we're going to fall apart. So all, already by saying, what would you like to have happen? You say, I want a result. And I, we explore what your result is and we explore what my result is. Mine is a relationship and yours is a report. We're not going to be able to stick together because that is undiscussed. So for me, yeah, if you don't do that, and this is what Laurelie does naturally, um, to, she's a matchmaker. So people like Laurelie and Trey and such, they won't declare what it is that is result for each of us because they, they know that we need to work out what that is. And if we can't work that out together, then we should not stay matched because it's just going to go badly. Um, so you're, you're not going to work this all out in one meet, meeting. You just, you won't. But I think you write about a container. That's the whole. Is I, it call, a place? I call OGM often a vessel or a container. I've been using that a bunch with, with this gesture. Yeah. So um, is it's, it's the whole yin and yang thing without going into it. Um, are you a container? Yeah, are you a container where, where things happen and, and organisations get birthed because they will probably insist on becoming their own thing? But if you were really good at clean language as an organisation and had a shared metaphor, you could at least hang together long enough to be able to be, evolve to the next step because your report and my relationships thing would work its way out you'd have a part that actually produces things that other people want, broken as they are, or we'd at least stick together long enough to know what the relation you need to do to stick together as a group to be able to become the next thing. Did that feel that, sorry, you asked me a question, it feels like I've given you several things, but there's no clean word for what we want. I can't think of a clean word. It's everybody's version of container, right. whether it's a metaphor, whether it's, um, bar, whether it's Kinevan, it's just a location. Yeah. You won't get one word that will do it. And, and, and clean language sounds like a way of figuring out, of describing the elephant to misappropriate a story. That's but exactly one of the experts. Um, see an elephant is one of the exercises they do. That would be such good fun. If I could run this that in this group, I would just be excellent. I would be so fun because it's see an elephant smell an elephant and everyone will come up with different versions of it and you'll think oh wow is that the variety we have in the room and you build something together which is not at all an elephant but has you know all sorts of aspects of it you get a and that's, up the other you can end. do clean language some clean language sessions just as that it might keep us all together long enough to be able to do it because otherwise just everyone splinters out it's just a natural thing there's nothing that keeps you together Thank you. We are about to hit two hours on this call. I know. And I'm taking the temperature of the room to see what's up. Uh, um, I'm off. Thanks, everybody. Lovely call. Uh, see you all later. Thank you. I'm thinking maybe we, we wrap the call because it's uh, I'm, I'm, my back is sore. I twisted, a, I twinged my, my hip uh, two days ago and like it's feeling twingy right now. Um, but I, I'm really grateful for this call. And Wendy, thank you for waking up and joining us. That was really magic. You, you added a layer of uh, 
a uh, rich, rich sort of nutrient solution to the conversation and took us in new directions, which are really good for us. Um, it's also nice to hear hear how you're thinking and what you're what you're focused on. Mm. Yeah, I really want the best for OGM, and I just see there's all this hope. It builds and then it collapses because people just can't stay together. And I don't want that. You know, you're too smart and too too lovely enough. Just see it build and collapse, build and collapse. So. I don't want that. <laughs> thank you, thank you for that wish. That's that's beautifully stated. Well, it sounds negative, but I don't want it to be negative. It's um. Well, there are ebbs, there are ebbs and flows to sort of everything, in a sense. I know. And 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 um, if we can harness the ebbs and flows, we can actually use that energy. There's a yeah. Yeah. there's a thing I there's a thing I like called polarity management, which is instead of instead of facing a binary problem as as like a a choice you have to make that'll get rid of half the people in the room, treat it as axes within which you swing back and forth intentionally, yeah. and then you make everybody happy, maybe, uh, and get things done better. Yeah, and that's that learning piece of what happens. Um, if you look at the bottom, it's sort of like, where are we? Oh, this is not so great. And the narrative is talking about what's what you can learn from it, and then you go to the top part, and then you come back and you take that as energy into your next thing, and then you build up to a new narrative and then you take that to a new, oh, gosh, is that where we're at? And you, you just go back and, and take that whole energy back in again. So that's Boisseau's thing again. You know, it's like, what do we learn from this? <laughs> and Boisseau was the originator of iSpace, which was yeah. a stimulus and a context for Kinevin. So Kinevin yes. builds on iSpace. So that's we're exactly, we're that's why I've been reading about it a lot this last week. Um, it's not because uh, independent of Kinevin. It's because you guys use ontologies and things like that as part of a wiki, as part of a brain. And if you can't actually name those things and you don't have a culture for understanding how to keep them clean enough, you can't do a massive wiki. I tried yesterday and I got stuck at the first step. I'm thinking, oh, how do I structure this? And then I went back into ontologies and I'm thinking, I knew this at the beginning. <laughs> Once you've done a doctorate, you know, I'm not saying it's the only way of knowing it, but finding that structure to put your knowledge in is a first step and you almost can't survive the first step because you've got to put a structure and you don't know why it exists this way. So brief story, um, 23 and some month years ago, um, I started using the brain and the inventor said, why don't you just start with your name as the, the central thought and then put business and personal under that and then go from there. And I was at the time I was a tech industry trends analyst. So under business, I started putting technology categories and all that. And it was a crappy, bad ontology, but I never, ever go back to that little region of my brain. And from there, I just started evolving local structure that always works at the local screen full. And I was yeah. always actively curating as I went. So I was always improving whatever I yeah. touched as I was cruising on, adding new stuff, you know, looking up old stuff, things like that. And that approach has worked great. Had I stopped to try to create the perfect ontology for that knowledge base, I probably would have killed myself. I probably would never have gotten done and I probably would not have gotten addicted to the tool. Yeah. So it's got, it's got an emergent property that I really, really like that way. And you've got to survive using that tool. You have to not jump off into something else and say something else is going to be better. That's what ontologies are. They're personal. Right. And, exactly. and you evolved that over 30 years, but you've got to stick together for, as an organization. All, your, all the things that you want to work with have got to stick, stick together an awful long time working together because that's you creating your tool. This isn't two people creating one tool. And that's really that's important. The so that the joint creation of shared context is a huge thing right in front of us because yeah. we're interested in a space that allows each of us to preserve our own opinion and point of view into the space. And yet... It would be really nice if we could crystallize and agree on this piece and this piece over here so that we don't end up being this explosive, yeah. recursively explosive knowledge space yeah. where nothing yeah. actually makes sense because everybody has their own full expression in their own language, but rather we begin to agree on chunks and pieces that turn into policy frameworks, that turn into action items, et cetera. Yeah, that's exactly it. And so it's great because you, you're such, it's so good that you're in the room, Jerry, because you've curated your own thing over such a long period of time just like Mark Carranza has done his own poetry for like 30 years it Since means a lot to him. it makes you look at that and it's beautiful but I'm not Mark I'm I look not at I look at Mark's output and I can't figure it out I don't know what he's writing no about. 
No, yeah. but that's what will happen if we can't, because you're not going to get a shared ontology. I was looking at one which was, um, what is it? A, a, um, pertinent and, I don't know, and it means things that are enduring, endurance and perdurance. So perdurance is supposed to be time stamped and endurance is things like rocks that continue to exist. And there are a lot of cultures that just don't talk about time in that way. It's circular or Z-shaped or whatever it is. So it's, it doesn't make any sense. And they're just two words, two categories. And that's, those, those are used as the basis of lots of other um, ontologies in, um, that's, I know it's a big word. It's just being, that's all the word is, being. Um, it's used in all sorts of IT things, how you classify things. And so at the very beginning, and if, if people don't agree with that from a cultural perspective, everything that comes out of it is going to be flawed. And it's just two words, something that endures, something that's stamped in, stamp in time. I love that. I've never heard that of time endurance, so I'm going to, I'm going to look it up like when, we, when we hang different. out. Some words don't, um, what's the example? Somebody said, oh, they've got no future tense in their particular language. Uh, yes. Um, um, which one was that? It's not the Hopi. I um, it was so one of the, it came from a TED talk, but anyway, so this guy, um, the guy was saying, well, that's, the, oh, I know it's, um, yeah, it's a TED talk about um, sense of time and, you know, the six different versions, the ways in which people look at time. These are not just esoteric things. If I don't agree with time, then I'm not going to produce the same thing at the same thing. You say soon, soon for me could be in three weeks and soon for you can be in, tomorrow it's mm -hmm. like right at the very beginning and that's seeded all the way through all the knowledge structures everyone assumes it <laughs> what sort of time is your time my time is six months time and your time is tomorrow well that's going to work well <laughs> exactly um phil, I, uh, phil I, wants to say something i saw that hang on phil has no? to leave he just typed into the chat no, I was just saying, uh, take but, but yeah so, but next, next, next time i see you, i'll be i'll be uk based so I'll talk to you are you from the uk uh, my parents are Irish, um, but I'm moving to London for a part-time master's at LSC. Ah, oh, that's, that's cool. I wish I yeah. knew you all so much better. I just came in <laughs> on the end. But... I Judy, needed to you. talk Go too, ahead. but thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we should start wrapping this call. Any, anyone else want to just add something by way of putting a bow on the conversation or a marker? I, would just say, I think maybe we, you know, might want to come back, back to this conversation. <laughs> I think it was billed as a one shot. And uh, I, I know I had something to do with, with taking it into other directions and, and um, getting back to the practical. Um, I mean, not that everything we're saying isn't, isn't in some way practical, but, but getting back to that essential, what is OGM? question seems like it would be a good thing cool. and I, I i'm recording this and i will share the recording on the matter most etc so uh, bill did you want to jump in yeah so wendy i'm sorry i didn't hear all of what you had to say it was uh, we had our farm to house delivery we had to unpack all the goodies um this thing reminded me there's something i used to be involved with the tavistock uh, psychodynamic group dynamics workshops and one of the things they were just couch, you know, they would be like residential. You go away for a week and you're in, assigned to a group to learn about leadership and authority with groups that have no leaders. You know, basically they used to say, don't come if you really need, you know, if you need psychological help, don't come. We're not going to offer it. <laughs> we're gonna, it's going to be a pressure cooker. But the thing they did, they just arranged these things as learning institutions so they you know they just put a boundary here's what we're, the container we're creating here is for learning and we're going to do it in the following ways and there's something wendy said and we all talk about containers it's like maybe part of ogm is having containers for certain activities or or so, I don't it's just I don't know I don't really not really clean but there was something about really you know it's like a, I was a member of a the Buddhist peace fellowship on the board for a long time when the the first Gulf War was going on and the woman we were having it at the board meeting and she said okay 
the news is bad. We're going to use magic. And she said, okay, everybody light a stick of incense. Go over here. We're going to chant these three things. We're going to go out there. We're going to scream at the top of our lungs. And she said, you know, we're going to put a boundary around this thing and we're going to do this. And then we're going to come back and do our business. And, yeah. uh, and it strikes me dancing for humans is like that because you can, yeah. there's a boundary, the song ends, but in the song, yeah, it can be really wild. Yeah. Really wild. I love what you're saying. Um, a friend of mine, he's American, Afro-American, and he uses drumming. Um, but that's, that's to help people access flow state. And it's about creating that the sound creates an environment that allows people to work at a different level, just like dance does. And that's the embodied piece. But we don't have at the moment a lot of that ability because we're not co-present. We're not physically with each other. So my embodied thing and your embodied thing, if we put it, if we do drumming at the moment, it wouldn't have the same resonance. It's happening over the internet. It doesn't actually affect my insides in the same way because the acoustics is different. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got flat Bill and flat and flat Jerry on, on the screen. And Jerry, you know, he's, I know, I know, but you've got real dimensions. <laughs> I, I keep my I keep my camera and my laptop at an angle on purpose so that I'm not just like, you know, in front of a, two, a 2D space. And, and I've got real plants behind me, not that they're lit up or anything. You can see how, how well I did my lighting this morning, not. Um, so we've got to be able to keep this dimensional, this embodiment piece so we're actually in the moment in flow with each other in a rich way and that's that's something that i see open global mind might want to go to not best of you know what we would like to have happen i want to be in an environment so i feel like i really am with you intellectually and and emotionally and we can then put a barrier around this the crappy bit and then go to business i agree with you michael uh, the only reason I'm saying these esoteric things is that I hang around with people like Dave Snowden at retreats drinking wine. I have had, I've, I've stayed in the same house with Dave and been to business meetings where they suddenly realized that I was the fly on the wall and I needed to sign, sign a non disclosure agreement. I'm thinking, okay, I'm now part of a business meeting for something I never expected to be part of because I'm sleeping in the bedroom next to Dave. <laughs> It's like, okay, well, this is, he, we were driving, he was driving the car, don't share this with anyone, back from the retreat where we had had wine and food together and the most amazing conversations, which is a retreat for a reason, was to get us all in the same zone to talk about design and I can't remember what the topic of that retreat was. So it was Whistler, it wasn't last year, but it was the year before everything collapsed and I'm so glad I went, I'm so glad. But anyway, he was driving us back and he was tired or whatever. And we just about got cleaned up by another car. So I, I almost died <laughs> because of Dave's driving in that instant. That's a story. We were in a confined space, but we were there because we went to a retreat. So the only reason I can tell that story was because there was an, an intent to get lots of fine minds together in one location to drink wine, have food together, have lots of random and structured and semi-structured conversations. We can't do that. I will never meet you, most of you, face to face, ever. Maybe well, if, I, once. if I manage to get my retreats back in order, we might actually pull that off. Um, eh, I can't afford to go to any of them. Well, <laughs> I shouldn't have afforded you to go to that, that one. And so that's part of the other thing is too. We have to be realistic. Is that you know I'm I'm from Australia and I it, it was really the end of everything that I did you know financially but I'm so glad I went to that event it was a source of so many good things but I couldn't they were happening all over the world a friend of mine who is in Canberra he went to six or five of them in like a year <laughs> I didn't have pockets that deep but mm -hmm. I went to the one and it gave me all these other good things but we don't have venues like that at the moment I mean I could come to Pacific maybe when I'm allowed out of Australia. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, I know. I just want to throw one thing out. Like yesterday, Pete and I got together to work on an architecture diagram. And even though we were in opposite sides of the Zoom, we had one diagram in front of us. Pete was typing and we actually were in a, working on throwing out ideas to each other, changing things, seeing on a work. So there was something akin to actually being more present and... Mm. 
actively negotiating while we were trying to create a you know an architecture diagram for the massive yeah. so it can, i think something can happen in a small a little way with you know yeah. with the, the kind of technologies we have in these shared spaces yeah exactly yeah it does happen so i was writing neuroscience articles for um a, an organization called frontline mind two brilliant people you going no oh yeah so frontline mind um, and i was recruited that's an amazing story too how i became part of that for just a little bit of time. So anyway, we were, the idea was to write a course for students, engineering students at Melbourne University to help keep them. It was based on the Kinevan framework, Dave Snowden's work in natural language, um, neuro-linguistic neuro programming, NLP. And these two guys are brilliant. And we were writing these articles and I'd done all the research um, with another guy, but a lot, a lot of it was my own. And then one guy's a filmmaker and the other guy, both of them are NLP practitioners who've worked with um, with Grinder and everyone right at the very beginning. So they've got like 10, 15 years worth of experience as communicators. And then we come onto this document and they zoom in and they're thinking, well, we need this metaphor, we need that cartoon, the, the wording for this should change put that at the bottom, all four of us were doing it at once. It was an incredible experience. It really was. And it then became a most, it became the production value was huge. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, this is now no longer mine. I felt that transition, but I knew that it was better because it was no longer mine. Right. And I could still see in the end part things that wouldn't have been there if I hadn't have put my hand up and said, this needs to be there, these words, this article, whatever it was. So you're right. Um, I've seen it um, on Miro when people are organising things. You mean Miro? Sorry. Oh, Miro. I, yeah, I didn't understand what you said. And I'm like, oh, right. Miro. 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 Yeah. yeah. It's okay. However <laughs> yeah, you, know you want to say it is good. But yeah. I, I, for, at first I didn't get it at all. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's just an example of us not, you know, the clean language part. It's like we could easily not have clarified that. <laughs> so um, I've seen it and I, I read a lot about flow and through Stephen Kotler's work and um, she sent, you know, Mahali, whatever is, I can't ever say his name. Every now I practice it and get it right for a while. Um, you know, this flow state, if we can get into a flow state and have something that's interactive enough, that's as good as we're going to get at the moment. Yeah. So right. you've got to have sleep. You've got to be not hungry or thirsty, you've got to be sitting somewhere comfortable and you've got to have tools that you all understand how to use and they've got to get you in an immersion state and you've got to have the clean language and bits and pieces so that at least our words are negotiated. Remember results, relationships, results, paper. <laughs> what do we want at the end of this? So if I, if I got any of you, if any of you wanted to join me, um, I need this sort of stuff is really important. I can't emphasize it. Dave processes it. He reads these things. He talks about them in story, but I can guarantee you he reads them and books and such. You can't just go into doing this stuff without having that level of knowledge. It, it can't and, happen. And I'm <laughs> my reading list is so vast at this point that I'm trying to figure out how do we each summarize works for one another. And Dave Snow has a lovely riff how summarizing is a terrible thing and you should be as close to the data as you can. But I think he means that in specific circumstances. But how might we together make sense out of these large works so that we can actually access the wisdom that's in them? Because yeah. I don't, I don't have time to read all of uh, Jared Diamond's uh, writing in order to critique why I don't like his later works and I do like his early works. But I just, ha I just have that instinct. It's like from the yeah. pieces I've seen and pieces I've done. But we have all these huge pieces ahead of us to to make sense out of, which takes us to yesterday's call which was, what is sense-making? All right, go ahead, Bill. Oh, well, I'd love to have been part of that. Again, so, it was probably the wrong time so, of day. Um, I can send you a, a, a link to the YouTube recording. It's on YouTube publicly. That would go be ahead, lovely. Bill. That will eat up far too much of my day. But yeah. Totally. <laughs> oh, well, I just wanted to say that this is, now that Wendy's here, but this is what I'm trying to do with this mess of wiki I've created for myself, is to take what I'm reading, find what jumps out for me, put it into some kind of a note in I'm using obsidian because I like the linking and then to, I'm going to just do the work of adding the context about why did I select this thing? Mm. You know, what is it about this that actually made me go, Whoa, 
this is really worth doing all the work I had to do to cut, paste, type, correct, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think that's one way, if we could share some of that, that we could share. I, I don't know. Years ago, I went to a South by Southwest, you know, and it was filled with the talks. And I don't know, Michael might have heard this, but I decided I wasn't going to take notes. I was going to create haiku. I just sat there with my computer and I just waited till sometime during the person's talk, a phrase popped out. And yeah. I wrote it down. And then I put in a few other phrases and later I created these like haiku of these talks, which even to today when I read them, I can have a sense of what I was feeling when I was in the talk, wow. even though most of the content of the talk is not yeah. there. So yeah. I'm thinking about maybe if we could practice, I don't, you know, I don't know. There's some way of trying to just get yeah. something to share that the bird came up earlier is evocative and has some value. For yeah, it's um, so much to share. So narrative, I work with narrative and text analytics around narrative. I can show you, um, I've done visualizations that are things, simple things like simple simple so um digital rights as in my bank account needs to be available to the world okay um you know analysis of 30 30 submissions to an australian entity that's saying is this a good thing or a bad thing and in in inside 30 minutes created a visualization across those 30 documents that actually meant something that you could go all the way through into the documents to find those things so I can do those, and they're big bits of knowledge, but it's in the end, it's an image that you can go into and out of. Now that's Leximat, so it's a good tool. I know how to use it. Um, so I can do this across, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of articles. Um, and it's a version of haiku, but the haiku is you embodied. It's that bottom layer, which is good. And the other is an abstraction of of 30 large, very, very, very long, complicated documents that were separated into banking and industry and other things. So, but it, to, to be able to negotiate what that top artifact means, you've got to be in a conversation. That's that narrative part. So haiku is good because it will mean you go back to yourself at that event, but I can't go back to you at that event. You can explain it and we can come up to some level of what your haiku was. So using it as a boundary object. So your haiku was a direct access to you, Bill, at that event. But it's not my access. It can't mean anything for me because I weren't there. It wasn't my haiku. But you need to be able to do the tiny thing inside the large thing. Yeah, and the tiny to... thing inside the large thing is what I was doing with the software. But it's still not my experience. If I could do that over all the haikus and the haiku was so perfect and that's why pe people do poetry it's like let's negotiate the meaning of these two words this one word why this full stop and then they'll spend centuries talking about why this full stop that doesn't make the world move very fast it gives people a rich experience over why the, why they put a comma in that comma in that place or a full stop or why that was a new line or this word that, that stopped things. So you need to be able to do this big and back. And we need to have a joint experience of what that is. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. While um, sharing each other's flow. And um, sharing each other's flow. And everyone's going to have to go because you've been here for hours and I haven't. And so I feel like I've chased you all away. Not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. It's just, I, you know. <laughs> and Michael, like I hardly even know you and I've only met Bill once and Jerry, I, I think this is maybe our second meeting or something like that. I think so, you yeah. look familiar, but... I mean, I've watched you. I watched you on the design by trust thing. I agree. I do. I've been involved in big design projects for rail lines and things like that. I do this stuff. I know how much the engineers miss each other over standards and such, and they just don't know that that standard exists. I've been designing rock balls at the local scout group. I didn't know about four of the standards on bouldering that I should have <laughs> known about. Now I have to go back and find out about them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know artificial climbing walls. They had the Olympics yesterday on the event. I don't know who won. But, you know, these are big documents and you don't even know they exist at the beginning. Right. Well, I don't have access to the standards unless um, I do something that I really don't want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, Mike, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. 
it's Love just it. like I need someone to tell me I needed those other four standards and now I can buy them or not. Um, so, yeah, little and large. But, you know, we've, we've got to pay attention. And if anyone can help, if anyone's willing to talk through these things with me, it will mean that I'm a better advisor to the group and I don't feel like I'm imp imposing. I thought what I did before was rude and I apologise. No worries. I just, I'm enthusiastic because I know how important it is. Um, the whole Kinevan framework's built on something like that. That's a good thing to hang your hat off. It's right. not just ran some random person saying, you should do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with, that, with that, I'm going to bottle this magic and uh, take us out of this call. Wendy, thank you for joining us. I'm yes, so glad thank you woke you. up. Thank you. All. Everybody else? Very nice. Yeah. Wendy. Michael, I, I don't know anything about Factor and I feel like I really should. Check it out. We'll we'll be glad to. It's connected to the massive wiki. It's in everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm not connected to you at all. Yeah. So I don't know what Factor does, and I feel like I should know what Factor does. <laughs> this is a solvable Bill, problem. Bill, can I? We work a little bit. I want to see what you've created on your thing, because it gives me a bit of courage to work out whether I'm I'm just going to throw ontologies up in the air. We're gonna make, we'll just make some ontological commitments and you know move on. It's turtles all the way down. Yeah, it like it is there. turtles all the way down. Well, anyway, I gotta run because open gotta global think. standards. Pardon? Yeah, that's it. Open global standards. We should we should boogie. Thanks everybody. Yeah, yeah don't right, start. Right. <laughs>